Yo, how are you doing, folks? Welcome to episode 91 of the Simple Life Podcast, the Big Nine One. Yeah, so now I said Big Nine last week, but yeah, I'm creative like that. You know me. Um, it's another week. We are getting ever closer to that hundreds episode. Still wanting suggestions for this guest. It needs to be a kind of a big guest for a hundred. I mean, how where? That's, that's a canny number of episodes. So drop your suggestions in the comments below, please, folks. And yeah, do strap yourselves in for what is going to be one hell of an interesting conversation about the sort of direction of, of cannabis as a whole, of an, as an industry across Europe with today's guest, who is an Irish cannabis brand consultant, architect, brand developer, and marketeer. I love that term, marketeer. Um, yeah, who, who works as uh, who's worked his way from the kitchen at the world famous Dutch coffee shop, the Bulldog in Amsterdam, to launching some of the biggest US brands here in Europe, including the powerhouse brand that is Cookies. Having worked at both side, both the corporate and the dispensary side, they like to think of themselves as a consumer, customer, and marketeer. They are Kieran O'Leary. How are you doing, brother? Oh, still on mute. Here we go. <laughs> Apologies, it was uh, the joint was taking uh, control of my hand. Thank that's you for the introduction. You're a gentleman. Uh, no, worries. no worries. Appreciate you taking the time, and uh, that's my excuse every time. Yeah, it was the joint took control of my hand. I did nothing. It was yeah. the weed that did it. <laughs> Trying to use two fingers as against the whole hand, it was uh, definitely the priority. <laughs> yeah. See, and this is what breeds innovation. We, see, we can immediately go on a segue straight off the start because we've seen like the Xbox control things and that where you get it, there's an adapter and it's like a joint clip so you can play you games. Yeah. yeah, I know. Those, uh, those things sold quite well, man. I'm pretty sure there was a couple of million units of that thing moved to, uh, to wow. Europe from China. Yeah, yeah, some guy made a ton of money on those. I can believe it. I can believe it. Um, yeah. So I suppose for people that don't really know yourself um it's you, you're quite you're known in the right circles as it were but a lot of people don't know how brands move how things are created and how uh things evolve in an evolution from concept to sort of actualization whereas i think you quite embody that um as we alluded to in your intro that you started working uh, um at the bulldog in amsterdam and sort of where you are now you've experienced most of the industry so I'm, I'm really looking forward to um to sort of picking your brains over the next sort of hour and hour and a half so i don't know why i'm looking at my imaginary watch there folks um <laughs> but i suppose then yeah let's jump sort of i guess straight into it with how and when did you first kind of get introduced to to cannabis uh, as a consumer uh, with the oh, boys oh. back in ireland <laughs> yeah like i mean i think just like probably 90 percent of your listeners um especially in the UK, like I'm Irish, I'm from Cork in Ireland, down the very southwest. Um, and yeah, I mean, the weather isn't great, it's always cold, it's always rainy, it's always windy, and you're smoking outdoors in the field, or if you're lucky, one of the boys has a car and you're driving around smoking joints in the car. Um, I mean, that's how I started smoking weed. I think I was 16, something like that. Um, relatively normal age, I think, for that sort of an area to start consuming cannabis, if you start consuming cannabis. I know people started smoking at 12, 13, but uh, yeah, 16 years of age, started smoking joints with the lads and haven't stopped since, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, it's been a great uh, gift to my life and it's really, uh, it's helped overall, I think, not, not even thinking of business when I say that, just life mm -hmm. in general. You know? yeah, so yeah, yeah, thank you for this. <laughs> I, yeah, I say the same to the plant every goddamn day. It's part part of the ritual, whether it be I verbalize it or not. There is that gratitude towards cannabis as a concept. It's given me a career, a life. You know, the ability to control and sort of govern my physical and mental health. It's yeah. such a powerful tool. Yeah, we have something in there with the uh, with the cup of tea and a joint in the morning too. I think a lot of your listeners can relate to that. That's uh, it's a nice ritual. I uh, I do enjoy to gather my thoughts for the day, meetings. Mm -hmm. emails you probably like yourself it's a very nice uh, ritual like you said uh, yeah so it's, it's a good relationship to have yeah. but yeah, yeah um to go back to your question man yeah 16 smoking weed and i'm in in cork and and in a professional capacity the first time i ever worked with cannabis would be i was 22 when i moved to holland i uh sold my car and moved to holland the next day i by myself with a backpack and uh, I lived out of a hostel for the first three, four months, Bob's Youth Hostel. If any of the old school Amsterdam people ever went to a hostel in Amsterdam, you'd definitely come across Bob's Youth Hostel. And uh, worked in the bulldog in the kitchen. Yeah. Mm. It was a, a lovely introduction to cannabis. It was, a, it was a one man kitchen right in the red light district. If anyone's been to the Bulldog Hotel, 
honestly, I still say to this day, like I love the Bulldog. I had never been there as a consumer. I kind of like automatically shied away from it because I was like, I smoke weed. I'm, I don't go to a franchise place. Yeah. Not even a franchise. Family-owned business. Mm-hmm. Just uh, touristic, as we know, um, because it has a good reputation. So it's kind of almost hating on it from the beginning because it was successful. Um, but once I went into uh, the hotel, and spe- specifically, that lounge bar is still to this day one of the best places to smoke cannabis and mm-hmm. consume uh, alcohol as well, if that's your preference. If you have a non-smoker there, they can consume soft drinks, coffees, etc., and a full kitchen. So mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to work in that one-man kitchen with its 29 dishes at one point for uh, nearly two years. Mm-hmm. And basically so that I could work on the bar afterwards. Mm-hmm. So like you can imagine... Like a bulldog is a crazy environment of people having a great time on holidays, consuming whatever they want to consume. And, you know, it's people on holidays, so they're having a good time. The hotel bar was that on steroids. So Mm. people, that was their hotel. Like, I mean, that's, you're smoking joints at the bar, ordering your thing is private, really nice. So Mm. I was wanting to just work on the bar. So I'd finish the kitchen at midnight, clean the kitchen till one work on the bar from 1 until 3 or 4 a.m., depending on how busy it was. And we just had great banter with the, with the customers, the clients, playing the music, smoking joints, drinking beers, uh, doing Jägermeister. Was, yeah. My health was not great, but it's, <laughs> it was mighty banter. Um, so started with the Bulldog in that capacity, loved it. Um, uh, took a little break, just contract-wise, went to work for Nike for a little bit. Bulldog called me, said, look, we're looking for a dealer. Um, or bud tender as they're now called um, in today's modern world um, uh, we're looking for a bud tender and we wonder if you come back and I love my time at the Bulldog so I came back and the bud tender at the very first coffee shop uh, in the well, what they what they say is the very first coffee shop in the world um, for sure the first coffee shop in Amsterdam um, that was uh, an experience that's that's uh, I wake I used to wake up in the middle of the night saying the price of pre-roll joints and the Wi-Fi password <laughs> and I still remember both, by the way. Um, and still very close with the bulldog. Um, I was back there recently, and the Wi-Fi password was still the same. <laughs> uh, price of the joints, not though. Uh, Amsterdam has changed. Um, mm. But yeah, it went from from the coffee shop uh, to the. I mean, there's no better way of putting it than saying like the back door of of how things work in some capacities. And that was very interesting and eye-opening and very. Uh, I suppose it's the best way to see Amsterdam at its, at its core, working with some real people who do the real work behind the scenes that nobody sees and have been doing so for a long time. And you know, Instagram and no social media, they don't even know what that stuff is. And these guys do more than most people with a couple of hundred thousand followers. So um, that was a nice, uh, very, very nice time learning there. Um, and then luckily enough, shout out Product Earth, they came around and the team in the office who I was very close with, big shout out to my friend Jack, Jack G-Man, uh, said, look, this guy speaks great English, is very interested in cannabis, loves the accessories because me and my best friend Jack, we used to smoke joints on my sofa and he worked in the office selling the accessories. He'd come with these new prototypes and do this and do that. We'd smoke those together, uh, smoke, play with those together while smoking joints. And he said, look, this guy's interested, take him to Product Earth. And that's how I got into marketing. Did a trade show here, trade show there, and before I knew it, I was full time doing marketing. Which turns out, out of all the oppo- all the jobs I had in my life, it's probably the most I was naturally gifted at. Mm. Uh, I really enjoy it. I think I was always thinking as a kid with, or as a teenager with a with a marketing mindset, wondering why is this advert like this, why is the packaging like that, you know, like mm. just always inquisitive in that sense. So I applied it to my favorite hobby, which is smoking cannabis, and that's a so that's a good recipe, man. Um, so marketing at the Bulldog, uh, online marketing mostly, social media, uh, we did some events, uh, we did the Bulldog boat tour on Amsterdam, we did new locations uh, worldwide, uh, including Italy and Ibiza and Barcelona with the Bulldog, multiple trade shows again, and, and a lot of influencer marketing as well, trying to get the, the real celebrities back into the Bulldog to, to I suppose, maintain their position in the industry and, and just give them some new exposure online so mm. that was that, that's how i entered the industry really yeah wow so i suppose take it all the way back to the beginning yep. did, did did you have a, a plan a job when you sold your car oh, in your backpack or were you just like uh, this will work this will work <laughs> bro i went for four months um 
I mean, it, it was in the middle of the recession in Ireland, so things weren't great for anybody, and there was horrible things happening to everybody at the time when mm. these things happened. And I was like, I'm done, I'm gone. I just go for four months, I come back, everything will be chill. Obviously, that was not the case. Um, I had a great time, and, and that's one of the main reasons that I stayed. Um, I had no plan. I had no intentions of entering the cannabis industry. I remember at one point I was working in the kitchen, and my friend said, ah, if you work really hard here, you might be a dealer one day. And I was like, no, that'll never happen. Like, mm-hmm. it's never possible. So I just, it's just, I knew there was opportunities there, very big company in the industry, you know what I mean? Good people, some people worked there 20, 30, 40 years and still work there. You know, so that says a lot about a company. So I was like, okay, these are good people. So I stuck with it through the hard times and, and, and some positions were better than others and some staff are better than others that you work with and some days are better than others. But, you know, you roll with the punches and, and that was the plan. Just, just roll with the punches and stick with it. Thankfully, yeah. it worked out. So how long in total were you in, in Amsterdam then in the end for your four months? Nearly nine years. Nine, nine years? Nearly nine years, yeah, 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 yeah. I left two years ago, basically two years ago last week, yeah. Wow. So, okay. I suppose I should inspire some people out there with their big dreams. I mean, I guess obviously the industry's changed quite a bit, which is something we'll uh, we'll discuss shortly. Because uh, I suppose you you see you left arguably what people would consider to be a mecca of cannabis in Amsterdam for an up and coming another mecca for for Amsterdam, in that you've moved to, if I'm not mistaken, Barcelona in Spain. Yeah, 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 and I have used that exact term actually myself as well, uh, as the yeah. new mecca of cannabis in Europe. Um, only because the skateboarders say it about Barcelona too. Um, yeah, it's a uh, look. I, I've been. I went to work for a company called Greenlane for the last two years, basically, since I left the Bulldog, and that brought me to Barcelona a lot. And in my capacity, one of the projects I had with Greenlane was bringing cookies, clothing, and SF to Barcelona on behalf of them. So I was here a lot. I was here looking at locations. I was here hiring staff. I was also doing uh, some events for, for some of the brands I was representing at the time, um, especially Vibes, uh, which I do a lot of promotion here for Vibes. And obviously, Vibes Papers is uh, linked heavily with Burner and Cookies, since it's Burner's brand. Um, yeah. and. and I was exploring the clubs with these events and, and with the promotion of the brands. And I was like, wow, this is, this is absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and Corona came and lockdown came and I was just probably like, you know, some people they want to change. And I was like, this is a really good change, especially for my career and for my, for my, I suppose my mental health because the, the weather and the food here is incredible. And um, the quality of the flower is also, um, in my opinion, far superior. Mm-hmm. Um, the selections that are available are, far larger in, in terms of edibles and, and vapes and, and, and cartridges and, and everything outside of flour. Um, so for me, it's been, a, it's been a great move. It's been a, a beautiful city for uh, any cannabis consumer to visit, I think. Especially mm-hmm. when the people are unaware of what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, I suppose if you're... The cliched thing of uh, in the pop culture of smoke a joint and everything goes colourful and a bit weird. Y- y- yeah, if you check out the architecture of someone like Gaudi in the city, y- y- yeah, it's designed for to be tri- oh, to a little yeah. bit trippy. And you pop the cars and gummies and go to Parkwell or you know a Gaudi building and you're yeah. gonna have a parade all the time for yourself. Oh, oh, I even like the um, I can't think of what the cathedral's called in the centre. The Sagrada Familia. There's, that's the one. Um, yeah. I'm glad you pronounced that because uh, mine would have no, been very. No. I, just went past it. I just went past it ten minutes ago from cookies on the way here. <laughs> it's one of those things. That every time you go past, I'll reread it in my head. Just I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> yeah, cool. I, I love hearing Americans say it. You're you're fine. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It could be a lot worse. Um, yeah. So I suppose then. Uh, we intimated a few moments ago about then Amsterdam and, and Holland as a, as a cannabis scene changing. Um, you've obviously now lived a good, a good few years sort of in, in the CSC model as opposed to the coffee shop model. Yeah. You've, you've obviously already stated that you, you feel the selection is larger. What are the other sort of you know positives, negatives, the pitfalls and differences that you, you sort of see between the two? I mean, the first thing is the members only aspect not from a point of exclusivity just from a point of 
just respect in the club. Everyone's a member, they've given their details, everyone's friends with everybody, everyone knows everyone by name. It's it's more of a, a homey environment. Mm. Um, new members join all the time and they make friends or they talk to somebody or, or they just do their own thing. You have the freedom to do that. I, I feel like in Amsterdam it used to be like that. I just think with mass tourism, it's just it's changed completely. Besides that, Amsterdam coffee shops are intentionally designed to be uncomfortable. Mm. Like, I, I, there's one comfortable coffee shop in Amsterdam in terms of like real comfort, and that would be like the top floor of Pre de Me, I think. Mm. Um, other than that, you know, the selection it, is a big deal. Um, the 500 gram limit in Holland doesn't help at all. Mm-hmm. I'm not, by that, I, I, I touch on that because I don't want to criticize either city, not because of like, I have friends who are coffee shop owners, I have friends who are club owners. Everyone does their best in, in the, the rules that they can work with, in the parameters that they're allowed to work. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem. So in yeah. Spain, the social club doesn't have any restrictions on the license in that respect of limit or THC restrictions like Holland has. Or and the THC restriction applies to vape carts, edibles, uh, even hash, certain types of hash. Uh, isolators technically not allowed. I know people are doing it, but talking about what's allowed, it's... Yeah, it's not great, um, and I think Spain, yeah, it's a lot looser in that sense, and um, because of the members only aspect, they're a lot more comfortable. They do events for their members. I can't imagine you doing a yoga session in an Amsterdam coffee shop. I mean, it's just, it's just yeah. not going to work. Yeah, you know? um, that happens in probably a dozen clubs every day in Barcelona because mm-hmm. there's so many here, and everyone's doing those sort of things. So, yeah, it's 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 different. I mean, if you're looking to consume cannabis in a more relaxed environment, Barcelona is to win. If you don't like to combust, Barcelona's the win. If you really want to get strain specific, Barcelona's the win. They have 50 strains plus in some social clubs. Mm-hmm. You can't do that in Amsterdam because of the restrictions. So, yeah, in, in a few aspects, it's a win. If you like prostitutes and mushrooms, Amsterdam's your place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose it's exactly that as a consumer. It depends what you're kind of going for, doesn't it? Um, if you've got non-smokers in your group, what are they going to do? You know, they, Some clubs do beer and wine. Mm. Barcelona, you know, um, that's okay, but they're not going to pay 20 euros membership fee for one year just to go drink a beer with a friend. Yeah. So, yeah, different strokes for different folks. I think that's a, a very apt way of describing it, to be fair. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> so, I suppose we keep hearing the same bullshit rhetoric it turns up every january february in the uk press and probably i imagine in other press around europe the mayor of amsterdam trying to then cut down on the coffee shops and add in restrictions and rarely has it really amounted to anything obviously there was a proposal put in recently uh you, you bring up the red light district um yeah, yeah, yeah. that was to move it and the backlash from everybody was enormous it's not just that, though. That's like the tip of the iceberg. That's the one that reaches the press. The things like closing the ATM machines after 10 o'clock, um, kicking the prostitutes out and renting the windows to uh, random businesses that need an opportunity and putting them in a red light window. This sort of stuff was going on for five, 10 years over there. And it's not the first mayor to do it either. And to be honest with you, the reason that any of this stuff gets any traction and the reason it succeeds in any capacity is because people like The Guardian and all these other bloody newspapers, they print these headlines and they say, Amsterdam banning tourists. Mm. They're not, but the mayor knows that the second she brings up the conversation again, that it's going to get worldwide headlines. And me as a bud tender, the best realistic example I can give you is this happened, I'm, I'm estimating here, but maybe 11, 12, 13 years ago, there was a big push to do it. They wanted what they call the weed pass. We need yeah. to be a red local, and that's another facet of what they're trying to do this time. But the weed pass um, was obviously, it never came into effect. But even whatever it was, seven, eight years later, when I was working as a bud tender, people thought that the weed pass came into effect, and they thought they couldn't buy weed. And I know street yeah. dealers who sell weed to tourists in Amsterdam mm-hmm. because they think that they can't buy weed in a coffee shop. So in, in one way, it works. All this fear-mongering yeah. and all this bullshit, it works. Mm-hmm. It, that's the annoyance of it, to be honest with you. This may not pass, but 5% of people 
who read that article will think that it has passed because they have a read just a stupid headline in the stupid newspaper. Yeah. Well, obviously, don't know anything about Dutch politics, and I don't blame them. Mm-hmm. It's boring as shit. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> this aspect of it is quite frustrating. Um, and, and I talk about the A10 machines and things like that. There's a list. Coffee shop owners can tell you this list, but there's a list of things that they've been trying to do to affect their business um, for the last number of years. And uh, this is the tip of the iceberg that you mentioned. This is the this is the headline. This is the mm-hmm. but they, there's a battle going on. When I came to Amsterdam first, there was like over 300 coffee shops, and since then they've closed down a number of them. Like there was a 1012 uh, act where they where they closed down every coffee shop on Varmestraat. I was working on the other street on the outer sides Verburg wall, which is where the bulldog is. I was working on the next street the night before when all those Vormestrat shops were open and the next night when they were all closed down. And the difference was ridiculous in traffic, in people, in business, in everything. Mm-hmm. But all they're doing is just, just pushing it out slowly, year by year, closing this because of a school. There was three or four coffee shops in the center closed down because of a school that was sold two years later. Yeah, the Mellow, Mellow Yellow was quite a controversial one, if I do. That was another one yeah. with a school. That was another one with a school. Yeah, that, that was very sad. Um, I believe they've opened the location. The same people have opened the location in Ibiza, though, so good for them. There. Nice. There's okay. a Mellow Yellow in Ibiza. Good, good, good. They're keeping the legacy alive. Uh, in some capacity, exactly, yeah. yeah. That was a tea house, though, technically speaking. Mila always reminds me. Yeah. The Mellow Yellow was a tea house, not a coffee shop, so. Yeah, I've, I've been... Uh, chastised by a couple of people as I've, as I've done my research and tried to to get future guests for this um because again it's the reason i want the people on i mean we we're lucky enough to get Miller on as, as a guest and the reason i want all of these people on as guests is exactly this to get all of this information yeah it's a convoluted thing and it's gonna be tens of thousands of hours but at least in one place on the internet that these conversations capture it and hold it in, in a kind of time capsule so that no other fucker can come in 30 years and go, we were the first coffee shop in Amsterdam. We were the first club. We were the, and it was like, no, no, no. We got the people who did it on record in on fucking camera. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If you if you want to talk about the license, people debate the license thing as well with Rustland, and I understand that debate. I mean, I believe the first place to sell weed in Amsterdam was Paradiso, the, the music venue. There was a, a house dealer allowed in the corner where you, you know, you could buy your weed. The, the, the government are the first people to do it in Amsterdam, to my knowledge, from what the locals tell me. Uh, but Rusland, and, and, which is now the plug, actually, shout out to Jack at the plug. They just they just caught Rusland, uh, which also could be the first coffee shop in Amsterdam. But it's all about matters of opinion and debate, and that just adds to the intrigue of, of Amsterdam and, and, and the mystery behind it, you know. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a... It's, it's a very unique city that is unfortunately changing in a cannabis perspective, it seems, for the worse. Do you think that it's intensified since the government started looking into these pilot programs? I mean, you alluded to the 500 gram problem before. To people that don't understand, that's uh, what the Dutch call the, the backdoor problem. And basically means that cannabis is legal to be sold out of the front door five grams at a time per person. Uh, the building itself can hold 500 grams on site, but the 500 grams can never get on site and you can't hold more than 500. So once your 500 has run out, it magically has to appear again. And so this means obviously there's, there's runners and all sorts of systems of criminality at different levels of people that are criminalized versus real criminals that operate at different levels sort of within this. So obviously a few years ago, the Dutch government started looking at, well, what if we grow and sell the weed? What if we regulate it? Common sense prevails. Did you have you noticed the change in in the intensity or no, the way? That project is for the south of Holland, so it wouldn't even ah. affect Amsterdam in the north. Um, I did not it, know that. It is another common mis- misconception um, because of headlines and things yeah. like that, mm-hmm. um, and Dutch geography also. Not <laughs> um, Quite unpronounceable as well. Amsterdam, most people are like I can read that. That's the one. It's ultra, you know the ones like, and you're like, um, yeah. Like people, are about, people are so excited about weed being sold in Maastricht and, and Tilburg and and you know all of these sort of towns, but they have amazing coffee shops mm-hmm. and they have different restrictions to Amsterdam. So I'm not going to, especially on a podcast, list the towns, <laughs> but certain towns don't even have a limit. And certain towns can sell certain types of edibles, like gummies, and they can use solventless. And so 
Mm. There's room there. Um, that license, I no, the pressure has been constant. The pre- to answer your question, the pressure has been constant on the coffee shops. Any excuse to close some down, they'll be doing it. Mm. I don't think they'll ever shut them all down. I just think they know they don't need 300. Yeah. Do you, do you think they'll seek to to regulate them? Or will the Dutch government, do you think, maybe be happy after running a pilot program like this to kind of do what the Canadians did with their first iteration of the model and go, all right, you'll do all the heavy work lifting and growing and whatever. We'll set a level of testing, buy everything back, and then act as the middleman. Or do you think they would then move to a position to government run the, the coffee shops and like standardize and homogenize these distribution hubs? Well, the government gave out the licenses, so I find it very hard for them to take the licenses back. I mean, there's still businesses in Amsterdam that have held a license from, from you know, 100 years ago, certain types of bars and cafes, and mm. they still retain the rights of that license. So I, I don't see that ever changing. Um, I mean, taxation could be a key to, mm. to, to everyone working together on it. We all know how that works um, but and the benefits of it. But... No, I just think they'd probably like to make an... I'm not going to speak on I don't live there anymore, you know what I mean? But yeah. I would think that they're just trying to reduce the number of coffee shops um, to a number. And same with the prostitutes, from what I can tell, they've just closed all those windows. And like you said, they're trying to move everything outside. Um, they seem to be adapting, from what I've read, a German model there. So regards to the weed, I know that the Canadian influence in Amsterdam is very strong. So maybe certain aspects of that mm. production element are going to be there with the control. I hope they just leave it go wreck, wreck and let the people do their thing because there's been activists in that country for 40, 50 years in some cases. Yeah. And the likes of Mila, like, you know, she give you stories, probably has given you stories about what it was like way back when for her with her kids and, and all of that. And you just don't want to see those people seeing the laws go the other way after working on the plant for so long, especially in a country like that. That that city is a city of freedom, like mm. freedom of expression, of, of sexuality, of, of everybody. It was gay pride there a few days ago. The place looked like it was lit. Like you don't see many cities like that in Europe. So mm. I hope for that city, which unfortunately will be a, a government decision from people who probably aren't even from Amsterdam or understand Amsterdam or even like Amsterdam, um, it's it's a flip of a coin, my friend. How that goes, but I hope it goes. Uh, that I, think, way. I think even if it, it does go the the worst way in this instance, that as you said, the spirit of rebellion of fuck you-ness, as to, to coin a term that exists yeah. within within the Dutch and specifically those that chose choose to live within Amsterdam. It's it is a mecca that draws people that want to express themselves they want to be free as themselves and in a paradox this creates what you know the conservative minded individual like, oh, it's, it can be a hellscape and it's really not it's bohemian and it, and it works it has its pitfalls the same way where, whenever you concentrate humans together in any area and you have socioeconomic issues but it's dealt with in a much more compassionate way when you look at their hard soft drug drug stance when you look yeah. at the, the smart shops and the proliferation of education over punishment when it comes to things like this, the openness with which the Dutch treat their kids, uh, taught and educate their kids about drugs as well offsets it. A lot of the uh, drug problems in cities like Amsterdam, predominantly in terms of dependent individuals, are people that end up trapped in those cities that didn't reside within them. And then you get- When I was your first buddy, people, kids didn't smoke weed because it was something that old people did. And that's what you're seeing in America now is, yeah, my dad smokes weed. I don't want to smoke weed. I want to smoke DMT. You know, yeah, I mean, now I want to go pop all the money in the world. Yeah, but now the kids are smoking weed in Amsterdam again because the weed is fire because the Americans <laughs> gave us all these tasty flavors. And instead of smoking cigarettes or whatever, they're smoking weed. And I'm like, hey, man, smoke your weed. In that capacity, mm. if it's over cigarettes, I, I smoke cigarettes, unfortunately. It's, it's the one addiction I can't seem to shake at the moment, but mm-hmm. we'll get there. But um, smoke your weed over your cigarettes all day, bro. Yeah, we, exactly that. When you put these things on a scale of harm, and again, that progressive attitude in Amsterdam, I think, is what's going to protect it. And I think in some ways it may end up being the front line for the war against legalization. And I mean this in the sense of corporate mass invested, um, this homogenized system of cannabis distribution we're seeing around the world in most regions, apart from places like Thailand that just pop up and go, now we're going to fucking buck the trend. Everywhere else, 
yeah, in it. Everywhere else, it's it's a bunch of Canadians, Americans, Israelis, Australians going around other countries going, hey, you, you guys in Colombia, in Zimbabwe, in... Con- I can't pronounce that country. Jeff, you go deal with those. In <laughs> this country, that's all it is. They're literally sent out there with their fucking portfolios and their packets of potential profits and whatever to go and corrupt the regional governments to, to replicate models that are failing. 80%... Thankfully, I'm Thailand, bro. My cousin was there. This, he is there right now. He called me this morning and he sent me a video then afterwards of the actual dispensary he was in, which is like a coffee shop. Mm-hmm. Like, back door, old school, not sticking with the government plan of going to a pharmacy and getting the, you know? Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is great. And he had 30, 40 choices of weed, all in jars with Boveda, nice big buds, good Didn't trim. Yeah. He had cookies, he had lemon haze, he had cheese. I, when I saw the cheese, I was like, bro, I can't get cheese here. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, yeah, man. It's weird, but it's great to see it happening. But mm. how it goes is the next question. And we're mm. seeing Cali crash right now. And we've seen other states fail. And Canada has been a bit of a failure as well. And these are countries that are particularly good at commerce and business. And, like, I mean, all you got to do is just search the top 10 cannabis stocks in both countries and you'll see the results on, on, on both of those. Um, it's, it's, it's sad to see, but mm. people refer me back to the dot-com um, bubble that burst. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you look at the top companies in the dot-com when they started up, uh, not many of those are around right now. And if mm. they are, they're not the powerhouse they once were. And so, one of the ones that did yeah, diver- yeah heavily diversified heavily, <laughs> so, so, heavily. So, yeah so this is what we're, we're, we're seeing in the cannabis space so obviously yeah. everyone, everyone got a bit uppity in 2018 uh when canada obviously announced and, and set in motion its version of legalization this then led to a flood of investment under the stock exchange which predominantly retrospectively there are studies that have looked into this suggest the majority came from alcohol tobacco and pharma very little came from your average mom and pop going, yeah, this is, these guys are going to be successful. We believe in this shit. And literally yeah. within six months to 18 months, the trajectory of investment that is pulled from the portfolios is phenomenal because they'd once it had gone day two, day three, and all the mom and pops went, shit, let's buy in, let's buy in. They were buying out the people that had already put the money in and had doubled their fucking money. I've seen pump and dumps myself firsthand. Like, yeah, yeah. And then to watch this... is yeah, across the end, it was like there was a play, like all of them had a playbook. It was like they all sat in a room before it and were like, this day we all do this, that day we do this. And it was just so synchronized of a movement. And so those same individuals that made all that fucking money, they're the ones following these little lobbyists around the world going, did you get them to sign that yet? No, all right, we're going to go to this country, we'll see you later. And there's just all these fucking idiots flying around the world trying to be Starbucks and, and Google of cannabis in terms of their corporate structure and positioning. And it's just... The plant won't let you do it. We're not going to let you fucking do it. Certain states in America are completely different to other states, and you can see it in their quality. Mm. For what I believe what's going on in some of the new states right now is, I mean, they're set for a bigger crash than what California's just gone through. Because the California model isn't even the worst model out there. I don't think it's even in the top five. At, at least Cali's got backdoor they, they can sell their waste product label as cali kentucky doesn't necessarily here's have the the same thing, pro- but here's the thing right that you're right there and cali's been producing x amount of cannabis for that reason right for however long 30 40 years okay mm-hmm. and they've been selling that to florida missouri ohio but these states are now legalizing and now they're making their own flour mm-hmm. And where's all that going to go? And that's another reason why you're seeing even the black market price of flowers crashing right now in Cali. It's starting to crash here so in the UK as well. Yeah, for sure. In Barcelona too. Packs in the clubs used to be 120 euros here. Now they're like 80, 90. Mm. Or Cali pack. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you'd be yeah. lucky if you got that wholesale two, three years ago, I believe. Mm. But the prices have crashed even in the black market. And I think it's because of what you just touched on. Ohio, whatever, yeah, they were buying all that stuff for years, but now they're making their own, now they're getting their own from the dispenser. Why is someone going to risk federal prison for for a couple of pounds that he's not going to make so much on because he's now competing with the government and the dispensary and the the licensed producer who's got all the, you know, room to do whatever uh, they need to do with the the lobbyists that are supporting them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's... 
Look, the only way, the only solution for all of this is wreck, man. It is, grow your own weed. Yeah. Give me the same choices when I'm buying my fruits and vegetables. I can grow it in my back garden, or I can buy it in the supermarket, or I can buy it at the organic store, or I can buy it at the bioecological organic store that doesn't even have plastic bags. I mean, you can go on and on. Things get very niche or niche as you want. Mm-hmm. I, in every single aspect of every single consumer goods. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if I want a table, bro, I can make a table like in my back garden. It won't be a good table. It will look like a piece of crap. It will probably have two and a half legs. But <laughs> if I have the freedom of choice to make my own table, I should have the freedom of choice to grow my own plant too. I've got a nice plant in my living room here. I can grow that however fucking tall I want to do it. You know what I mean? If my dog eats yeah. this plant, it's a problem because I believe it's poisonous. But there's no fucking regulations on that. I had to find that out for myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then that should be the information that's there. And then if there is an issue, you should be able to take your dog to the vet and know it was an accident and you then shouldn't be sought as a criminal or... Do you know what I mean? There, there are, you well, can... if, I vaporize, if I vaporize half the kitchen chemicals in my, uh, in my kitchen chemicals or bathroom products or whatever, it's going to kill me, bro. Like, I mean, you yeah, can graffiti this... whatever they want with a number of different items in the world. You can sell me paracetamol. I can eat two packets of it. Ba- ba- mean, yeah, Bas- basic, what... basic disinfect, disinfectant and bleach makes a form of... Oh, what is it? It's some sort of it's not sarin gas, but it's some sort of weird gas that literally you, pa- you, can, you, can pa- you, you literally pass out from it, it'll poison you, and, and you'll you'll die from it. Yeah, yeah. And that's two chemicals yeah. again that are just sold without obviously bleach. We, we all have a fucking we all know not to drink bleach kind of way. But there was it's that, that Tide Pod thing of three years ago. <laughs> the Tide Pod thing. There you go. Another <laughs> thing. Like I mean, look at how, look at how quickly they they uh, enforced that on fucking washing detergent. Like I mean. Mm. Yeah. It, it, we all know uh, you've you've discussed it at arm's length for a long, long time. I've seen this across a couple of countries. I've worked with people from a number of different places that are either going legal or are legal, or we've been around the world with cannabis. We all know it's not about the fucking plant and what it does to. You. We all know it's about other people's agendas and what they want to do and how we would take away from their profit margin on product X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. And tobacco would feel the hit and alcohol would feel the hit and big pharma would definitely feel the hit i mean all these people are too powerful with with, with government officials and, and government officials make these decisions and, and if they've got that big of an agenda we know we've got that good of a product if someone's trying that hard to get rid of you like you must be doing something right and if people yeah. are fighting you for two thousand years bro they must be really pissed at you like yeah. you must really be a threat dude because like most wars last you know maximum three four five years this war is going on a long 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 time and it's going on worldwide only now yeah. we started to see it crumble little by little and now it's time for the likes of yourselves and and everyone starts speaking up more and more and more and just start chipping away at that wall of stupidity that is prohibition yeah, right? yeah the propaganda yeah. the bullshit and the lies man i mean i i agree entirely that what i suppose you're terming wreck in in your summation there I've been toying around this idea recently of a simple equation to try to get people to understand conceptually what I mean when I say descheduling. And that is the concept, ubiquitous legal concept that currently stands in all its hybrid forms of legalization, plus the definition of de facto one and de jure decriminalization together equals descheduling. Because if there is no crime that could be committed by an individual with cannabis as a plant, it then shouldn't be scheduled. Therefore, the plant is free and we can do whatever the fuck we want with it. Cannabis then is these cannabis-derived drugs like Sativex, Epidiolex, Dravenol, various other compounds that frankly are potentially lethal and dangerous, allegedly allowed and allegedly up in here, just my legal protection in the fucking future. Um, But these products, then the efficacy of them is far reduced compared to whole plant products. The potential risks of them are far increased, but the profit margin, that's where the main thing lies, is through the fucking roof. It's a patented product that they can produce infinitum. And so that's- You can check those profit margins too, by the way. All that is public information. Exactly that. We just look at the GW sales, the fucking jazz and what was paid there. I think, uh, again, for legal reasons, not naming the individual who was in charge, but we all know his name, um, made, I think, 64 million pounds as his personal take back from the sale of that company. Horrendous. Yeah, not bad for tw- not bad for twenty years' work. <laughs> Let me ask you an honest question, though, bro. Right, because you're a good person to ask. I probably ask you this off air, right? But mm-hmm. it's something always in the back of my mind, and I don't live at home for a long, long time. And we come from different countries, but very similar cultures. 
Yeah. But what do you think would happen back home if we did legalize and gave people consumption in the same way we give people alcohol consumption? Because I see excessive use there and people, as we say in Ireland, some elements of society taking the piss. You know, like, for example, one of the worst things about Amsterdam is stag parties. Yeah, yeah. Stag parties have literally, in my opinion, ruined Amsterdam Red Light District. It is no longer what it is. It is just people of groups of 20 trying to get in small buildings from the 1700s, and it just ruins for everybody. And then they're dressed like giant penises, and then it's just ridiculous. So I can see similar things happening back home, and I can see it being abused to a point where we may even shoot ourselves in the foot in terms of what we want. So like we get what we want and then we abuse it and then we go two steps back. And that is a big fear for me. So that's a big, big yeah. fear for me because I see consumption differently in terms of everything as I go around the world and whether that be coffee or alcohol or food, every country has different ways of consuming certain products or certain types of aspects of life. Um, and I think, where we come from or culture is a little bit different in terms of, of, of substance abuse. I think if you look at cocaine use in, in the UK and in London, I think it's like top of the world as far as I know London. Like currently it is, yeah, I think it overtook Barcelona the other year. Yeah, and I believe Scotland has like these absurd numbers of heroin overdoses. Highest, highest per capita drug deaths, yeah. Our drug deaths just topped over 4,000. And I know that Ireland, I mean, we only discovered what alcoholism was recently. Before that, it was just, he liked to drink. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, we, we probably invented alcoholism. So, like, and I've been affected by that myself with friends, family, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, how, what are we going to do with cannabis? I mean, what, yeah. the worst case scenario is you fall asleep and you get the munchies. Thank God for that. But what, like, I mean, are people going to be crashing cars and saying, oh, sorry, I was stoned. It's the weed's fault. Uh, are people going to be doing stupid? I mean, it happened with yeah. mushrooms in Amsterdam. People started going psychotic and doing stupid stuff and blaming on mushrooms, and now we mm -hmm. can only get truffles in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. not mushrooms. So it's a debate in my head for a long time. I, I don't know how that will go. No, I, I have been and had this debate, and still, to be honest with you, do. Uh, one of the traits I appreciate most about my psyche, if that's an interesting sense, I don't mean, oh, I think this is what I think it was meant about myself, but one of the aspects of who I as we all discover ourselves to be is that i'm always very analytical and always trying to update my opinion and my belief so as people that have watched me for a long time have watched me evolve in real time as i learn more and adapt more and along that process where i first started with this was with initially with the same fear it was oh my god if you give drugs to people that consume alcohol now to kill themselves and then i started to think more and more about well why do we consume excessively alcohol particularly why do we have a problematic relationship with tea in this country you know what i mean uh to the point where we we more than yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we go back to the statistics we drink more tea the irish drink more tea per person than indian people so you know that's that's interesting because we started a war with just a we the british started a war with fucking china although there i suppose at that, at that time you were under our rules so we all collectively together without being too contentious there my irish brothers and sisters please don't get at me um <laughs> I mean that with all love, but I just mean it in terms of the, the timeline. Well, you're right, though. We have a problem with that too. You're right, though. We are sorry for interrupting, but you're completely right, man. Mm. Yeah. So, so it was we 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 were in that together. Um, in the same way that the Welsh are still fucked with the English of what they do now, in the same way I feel as a Northerner, I'm fucked as to what Westminster wants to do. We're all all in this dirty vessel together, sailing across a shit sea that none of us plan to be on. Um, but yeah, so we waged the, the opium wars with China, you know, we fucking made the Indians fucking grow all this opium to sell the fucking China to get the best tea in the fucking world. And since then we've had, is Western Europeans, a problematic relationship with certain substances. And I think it's, it's kind of a hangover of affluence, the, the, the image of having stuff, meaning you're a good person. You know, and the same with the Victorians, there were larger people, so the more large you were, the more affluent you were, you could afford to be fat. Fuck me, you must have money, therefore you're good. So <laughs> those are yeah, you're right. Though. Yeah, so those opinions still almost carry true. So now this tokenism in the Western world is to have stuff. I look at the stuff I've got. This means that I have achieved things, therefore I'm a good person. You know what I mean? It by bypasses bypasses this whole need to get to know anyone. We can just superficially scroll past them and go, they're successful, they're a good person. It's so wired into our brains now, you know what I mean? So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think that then part of this status 
is then the, the lads. I, I, I'm a vegan now, as you know. I think we've had a few joking conversations about this in the past. Uh, when I was, you think, served ham at the uh, the launch of the Bulldog Rome. Yeah, thing. yeah, you're on that yeah. list of vegan friends. Yeah, yeah so I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> With a special menu at the door. Um, exactly, but, yeah. But yes, yeah, so we, we've always had a, a sort of a conversation about this, and then with the um, oh damn it, that joke was too funny to waste my thought. Uh, <laughs> oh no, the beginning of ex- excess of meat of like so me and me and the boys when I was late teen, early twenties, and that it would be you'd sit and you get meat sweats. Who can eat the most meat? You know, and you'd order a big fucking thing. And you'd be like, right, and you gone through it. And me and my mate Johnny, fucking bless him, it was a steak eating challenge that, that finally knocked me off meat and turned me vegetarian and it was literally we'd done like a 20 summer ounce st- we drove past it me him and his missus and his missus was vegan at the time and she was mortified by the whole thing and we were going to go have a steak challenge so we went into this pub and slapped it down and i got honestly like quarter of the way through it and i'd watched cowspiracy on acid maybe a couple of weeks beforehand and it was so in my brain and this thing was alive and i was like i killed this it died for me to be full and I walked outside and honestly, I cried. I walked around the car park, I had a joint. And his missus at the time came up, he was put her arm around and went, you're one of us now. <laughs> and I was just like, what the fuck? But I think again, it's this, um, to go back to sort of my point is, it's this competitive nature. It's showing that we have more, so therefore I can consume more alcohol. I can sniff, you know, I had three bags last night. I had four bags last night. You know what I mean? That kind of, it's bravado, it's a form of identification. But when you then have tribal identity, actual identity in the clubs and in these other spaces, we self-regulate. Do you know what I mean? So then if somebody comes in and they're sat smoking, like go caning through it, another member will be like, you're all right. What's, what's going on? There'll be you know, the self-regulation and regulating environment. A good way to put that is is recently, as you know, I've, I've been involved in the Cookie Social Club over here in Barcelona, which is like 400 square meters, you know, like large lounge mm-hmm. area, you know, really what you would expect a cookies consumption lounge to be. Mm-hmm. And myself and some friends just did a nice project. Uh, we call it Feliz, um, F-E-L-I-Z. Absolutely. And that, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, I was just going to say I've seen on Instagram. Oh, thanks, dude. <laughs> that means we're doing something right. Um, it's it's small and it's quaint and it's literally centered around a beautiful table that's like a one piece of wood, you know, like a living table kind of thing. And everyone sits around and smokes and dabs together. And that's a self-regulation right there. I mean, if you have a large group and you all want to, you know, sit down and watch a funny video together or, or, or you know, try a whole Cali menu of, of cookies flavors, you go to cookies. If you want to sit down and have a nice quiet dab with some friends who are definitely hanging out there already, mm-hmm. you can go to Felice. Uh, you can go to RDM, which is like a clubhouse full of ping pong and, and, and um, uh, what are those uh, pong machines? I don't know, the, the, the pinball machines. Yeah. Um, PS5s. Um, you got places like The Plug, which is literally catered for, for I suppose, specifically for the English audience. Um, you've got places like HQ, which is extremely um, beautiful and elegant and caters to a completely different um, type of clientele. Mm-hmm. I mean, choices for everybody, the list can go on. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that mm-hmm. self-regulation has happened by the people, not by the government. Just to be yeah. clear on that. Mm-hmm. Each person has the same license. They decide what they want to do with it. They may be smaller or bigger than others because of the location. Some may have natural sunlight, some may have not. May dictate how it looks inside. Mm-hmm. Same license. Yeah. Humans made it. Right, it is. And each stoner with their own vision. And there's a passionate man behind every social club. I can tell you that much. It's a very hardworking staff. The people who are there day in, day out, they know who they are. Like they, they work very, very hard to make sure these clubs maintain their atmosphere. Mm. Not just that. So self-regulation. I like your optimistic approach. I hope that would be the case back home. Mm-hmm. Maybe that is kind of the case with bars. Maybe you do have different types of pubs. And you have the gastro pubs, you have the old school pubs, and you have the whatever. It's, the bars. I mean, it's, it's, that's only sort of, yeah, one, one part of the answer. I mean, the other is that as we start to see around the world, in any region where you legalize cannabis, regardless of the breadth of its model, as a way to shove that all together with a shitty sentence, um, the, the people that then consume it, it affects their consciousness. So we then start to see other more progressive laws start to happen. You then start to see people going, well, why are people in prison for, for weed? You know, 
why can't yeah. they grow their own? You know, why do we yeah. find people for crossing the road? Why? And it become we start to then look at other things. Do they become more accepting of, of other sexualities, of other religious identities, ethnicities, of other, you know, little quirks of subculture in the ways we 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 define and and and, and guise ourselves in 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 garb? You know, the the I mean, like, so everything from goths all the way through to fucking your um, steampunk folk. You know what I mean? It's it's. 100%. And any space we can create where people are more expressive to be themselves, they feel, I feel, they feel, in my opinion, that they, or in my estimation, and probably from my own experience as well, actually, the more I'm allowed to be me, the less inclined I am to escape from me in my life. I stopped drinking when I started facing my trauma and I didn't then have to get some, something to get me out on an evening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still smoke weed every night to fucking make do the same thing. But becoming then conscious of that trauma, I then felt ne less of a need to sort of tackle it in that way. Same way with the other drugs. We, we all go through honeymoon periods, and especially the youth. And this is one thing I have to remind a lot of my academic friends when we're on our conversations and they're chatting about policies and whatever. And I go, no, no, no. Every week you get older. Every week they turn 18 and they're still full of fucking gusto, stupidity, and spunk. Yes, you need to regulate and help them, but they're still going to circumnavigate your rules. If you say you're allowed one ecstasy pill, they're going to go take two. If you say you can go and buy this half a gram, they're going to send three mates and get a gram and a half. Whatever it is you do, they'll circumnavigate. And then the people with dependencies will do the same because humans are creative, wonderful, problem-solving creatures. So in my opinion, I think, as I said, that ubiquitous model starting with cannabis, I think will allow the culture to understand that, yeah, I may want to drink a beer on a Thursday, you know, go out with the boys for two or three, but I can take a couple of, you know, bags of kush with us, you know what I mean? And have one, two or three beers rather than trying to, oh, I'm 20, 20, oh, look at Dave, look at Dave, hey. Do you know? For me, it's all about that. For me, it's all about like picking your vice and in the crazy world that is 2022 and, and everything that's come before it. Mm -hmm. I mean, pick your vice, choose wisely, don't abuse it, regulate yourself, I mean, mm -hmm like you're an adult at the end of the day, like you can live with your own decisions. You know what I mean? If you take too much of something, learn from that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like I smoke a lot of weed all day, man, but I don't put like half a gram into every single joint. I got stuff to do. I do that in the evening. You know what I mean? In the evening, yeah. I up my consumption, I'm relaxing. I'm, I've got stuff to do all day. I said no to like three or four joints today because mm -hmm. they're like just pure Cali and I'm just yeah. smoking my ash regulating myself through the day that took years man it took me years to acknowledge that i should not smoke haze because it made me absolutely batshit crazy and paranoid mm -hmm. you know what i mean a bit of education self-regulation the rest will come good in my opinion yeah with support as well because as you say we're all fallible and we all fuck up and we all have moments where we're gonna turn to the dependence of something at some point in our lives all of us will whether it's, you know, I mean, you, it's like sometimes I do, I smash myself full of coffee to, to like heighten my ADHD. So I'm so fucking wired. All I can do is hyperfixate on one fucking task while trying to do three of the juggles in, in the background. But I can manage in, in that sense, you know what I mean? But that's a, if that's not self regulating. That's not in, in the best of intention, but it's then something and a you behavior that I engage in. I, I self regulate. I don't drink coffee because I mm -hmm. don't need another vice <laughs> and i know yeah. i will depend on it and i've seen everyone around me depend on it mm -hmm. and i like, look i just got my two cups of tea in the morning there's a bit of caffeine in there kick start the day i'm good it's in more than yeah. any human needs yeah. to start that day and that's me self-regulating myself because everybody is different you know what i mean like not everyone wakes up the same that's for damn sure and not everybody sleeps the same well, is it also to do with the, the ubiquity of then of the substance? I'm just thinking there, what if we had like, yeah. if, you, if you had coffee clubs, if, if you, Costa and Starbucks didn't have these little machines in every fucking petrol station and every other station was a fucking giant service bar of theirs and whatever, like if coffee wasn't as ubiquitous or, or like I said, was had a different access model, because basically what, what I'm trying to go the long way around here is my fear is the ubiquity of marketing and advertising as an imperative for the capitalist machine that will invest in cannabis every quarter. It's 100% going that way. It is 100% going that way. So that's it, gonna... is, it is already there in certain countries like the US. It, they, they directly, when you look at the, the data, they relate 
I've, I've seen so many demographics that relate um, tax revenue from cannabis compared to coffee or Starbucks or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. It is 100%. I mean, Amsterdam are coffee shops. You know what I mean? I think it's it's literally, I can't see it going any other way. Mm-hmm. I can't see capitalism leaving it go any other way. I can see certain yeah. countries like Thailand doing their own thing, but there's still going to be a capitalist nature to it until rec- yeah. recreational, complete, total and utter freedom, and then come the other issues. But those issues will also level out after 10, 20 years of, of, of uh, I suppose, use by the population and by the general public of self-regulation that we touched on. I think that's it's one or the other, bro. But I, I'm leaning more towards the unfortunate capitalistic future of it. Uh, yeah, I think I agree that it's it's an inevitability, but I think in its heart that is going to be the thing that causes the most damage. And I think actually they are kind of banking on it because then they are the ones who get to solve the problems they create. So when they go, oh, it was this product or this range of products that we don't happen to sell that were the bad ones, so we're going to ban them. Um, there's this this other selection of cultivars that oh yeah we think there's a certain terpene that you know we don't grow we've bred out of ours that oh yeah that's bad you're not allowed that and I I ultimately fear that cannabis will be ubiquitously available in 10 years but very few people will know what a fucking cannabis plant looks like that they'll be able to buy the flower buy the products but the idea of a that's all right no that's that's fine with me that's that's okay with me if you want to find the plant you find it it'll find you Mm. that's okay with me I don't need. I know. Don't need everybody to smoke it, man. I don't want everybody to smoke it. Everyone, different strokes for different folks. Leave the drinkers drink. Leave the coke users sniff. Leave the smokers smoke. You know but what that, I mean? But that's the necessity. Don't of- punish me for fucking doing it, but. But yeah, like, I gotta say, like I left Ireland because I had some problems with the police for smoking weed in my house with my boys. They kicked in my door. We're literally playing PlayStation. <laughs> like, sorry, my dog gets excited. Yeah, I heard the police. You said police, and he went crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, basically, for those reasons, I left the. One of those reasons, I left the country. So to do something like that is, it's not okay to punish someone for doing what they want to do and giving them the freedom to. Yeah. Do. As long as I get that status, I'm fine with everything. Just yeah, don't punish me for using what I want to use. That doesn't do me any harm. Mm-hmm. It doesn't harm anyone around me. I mean, but cigarette smoke is more passive than fucking weed smoke. So that, the thing is that the capitalists have basically got two routes, though, haven't they? They've either got, we market the shit out of this and get every 18 and 21-year-old to be a cannabis consumer from the get-go and their brand loyalty for life and they'll always use our product and our service and buy all of our shit every time we release it. Or they ignore the new, the new market, as you say, and they fence off what they've got and they get ever more aggressive and physically, not physically violent upon it to own and... Not too sure what happened there, folks. A uh, bit of a technical issue, but we seem to be back at it. All right. Gremlins don't seem to be kicking around the office of the studio, so we're doing all right. All right, let's move on. Without further ado, I can't actually remember what we were just talking about, so we're just going to continue over my extensive <laughs> list of questions today. Um, not saying that cannabis affects memory or anything like that. Uh, oh, not at all. Um, <laughs> I think we, we, were, we were talking basically... Obviously, we've talked about the CSCs, uh, the cannabis social clubs in Spain and the coffee shops in Holland. Germany is obviously an interesting market that's coming on board uh, sort of next year. Do you think this is going to, in my what my estimation or my belief is that it's going to kind of kickstart dominoes falling the same way we saw in, in America with the States? Where where do you think Ireland is, is, in, is in this? Because obviously, traditionally, there have been a lot stricter with with cannabis i mean the the street price of this reflects it in terms of raw flour um so what are are your thoughts on um on that potential scenario catholic country you know Mm. i mean ahead of countries in certain ways we like to pass certain laws ahead of other countries to seem progressive but in many ways which i'm not going to discuss which is very common knowledge we are very much behind um so the sentences regarding the flower are considerably high therefore the price is very high the nobody seems to be growing there i mean people are growing but not in the terms of like the uk with the with the star dogs and the hazes and this you know 
mm-hmm. 20, 30, 40. I mean, people are growing for themselves, I think, and, and there's little grows going on, but the, the, the sentences for growing the plant are, are absurd. So that's reflected in the grows. I mean, to my knowledge, there's probably only 10 or 12 grow shops in all of Ireland, maybe not even anymore. So wow. that says a lot. I think you have more than that in one county in England. Um, yeah, I know that they've started some large hemp farms and things like that. And I know that there was um, some progression in the last couple of years over a couple of highlighted cases in the news regarding certain children that needed their medicine and mothers being pay, uh, uh, pursued because of that and, and, and persecuted. And I believe one of the mothers even even walked the whole way from Cork to Dublin mm-hmm. um, to prove her point. So um, hopefully uh, the momentum continues from the work that these sort of people have done and we can actually get something going. Like I know the UK got their licenses a long time ago and they slowly, slowly rolled them. I think we're kind of at that beginner baby stage. Mm-hmm. I don't see anything moving fast in Ireland, unfortunately. It's one of the reasons why I left. I, I mean, I couldn't even smoke in peace, man. Yeah. You know, like three police kicking in my door, playing PlayStation with two of my friends. One had a broken leg. You know, they came over to hang out because I had a place and a safe place to smoke. Mm. Ah, it's just it's madness and harming nobody. The only good thing about that scenario is I was uh, on a place called High Street. So <laughs> and the warrant was pretty funny. Um, all that for like six, seven grams of weed. Um, which is between three people. Like they found yeah. two, they found uh, two or three grams. I didn't even know was in the house. <laughs> like, that that nearly doubled what their tally. I think they were expecting Pablo Escobar or something. Yeah. Um, just personal smoke, um, and that just set me in a mental spiral of mm. I cannot relax and I'm smoking to relax. I don't want to go drinking. I did a lot of it in Ireland, unfortunately, and I think that was because of what we just explained. So, yeah. I think it's, for me, I don't see it happening. I don't know if I'd even go back, even if they did, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, I think there's going to be a stigma there for quite a long time. We've got you yeah. know, a generation there who are very anti a lot of things and were reared a certain way in a certain type of country that has progressed a little, but not enough, in my opinion. So, mm. progressive, like I said, I, I was um, seeing in Amsterdam um for for the last uh, was it eight nine years and then moving here for two years is also very progressive as a city um i couldn't see myself going backwards like that mm-hmm. for a even if they did legalize yeah it's interesting i think you hit the nail on the head in terms of it being about uh the, the religious inclination of of the country and Obviously, there have been some some uh, advancements and some uh, some victories and championed by some amazing people. I mean, yeah, shout out Vera Toomey, uh, who was the the mother that, that walked. Um, yeah, I didn't want to just in yeah. case you can do it on your yeah, show. Yeah, no problem. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, I can I can name drop Vera. We've been we've been friends for a good few years, um, and yeah. uh, I've had the privilege of meeting her a few times uh, at the start of her journey, and then watching her strength throughout the campaign was was powerful you know what i mean it was inspiring and frankly in my in my opinion she, she moved the bar for more far more than any of the the corporate entities and the other structures that were in position leading up to that point obviously ireland are now discussing the 0.3 in their air quotes in cannabis uh hemp hemp cannabis however we're going to term this where i can say that word without feeling like i'm an asshole um <laughs> so, right of the cannabis industry <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> <CBD flower>. wow. <laughs> so they're gonna have the zero three they're gonna move a little bit they've obviously created this um i can't remember what they called it but it's basically like a dispensation so a medical a medicinal system that they're obviously calling medical cannabis air quotes medical cannabis and to my last time I looked in on this, I think there was a few applications in it, but nobody had been onboarded onto it yet. And it was basically said the Irish health services would pay for the medications because obviously then the medications are available off license for certain individuals, but they're paying for it again privately in much the same way um, the 17 to 20,000 people are currently here in the UK. Um, but there's an interesting thing you could look at here. Like, as I mentioned with those dominoes in Europe, another very, very Catholic country Italy. Italy managed to get about half a million people to put together a ref- referendum, uh, signatures onto a referendum. That, yeah, the government kind of went, we'll look at this later, uh, wanting to obviously allow for home grow, allow for uh, an adaptive market for cannabis, but also for entheogens and psychedelics. So if Italy perhaps could 
become more progressive obviously as a as a space for people growing hemp cannabis it is a good space because they've got a 0.6 percent thc limit so i know they tried it right i mean like that cbd industry in italy went through the roof and then crash and burned within like 18 24 months as far as i know from a, from a business standpoint in, ter- in terms in terms of the regulations were changed consistently as well in that period of time which doesn't allow anybody to succeed whether it be big business or small mom and pop which would probably be affected even more mm-hmm. um i also see italians as probably the number one expat community to work in the cannabis industry outside of italy so like in if you go to any coffee shop or social club in barcelona or amsterdam full of italians Interesting. some of the best growers i've met in spain italians well, the, the, best the, makers, the winners of Amasa rosin for the last few years what I consider to be the prestige um, rosin cup, at least in Europe, if not the world, Italians. Um, why they're not at home doing it? I mean, traditionally speaking, uh, Italy hasn't been the most straightforward in terms of uh, policies. And, and, and I mean, there's been a lot of corruption scandals and I, I could see a, an absolute headache, a nightmare going on there, to be perfectly honest with you. Mm-hmm. I hope I'm completely wrong. Um, I know there was a social club tried to open in Italy. I saw some headline, uh, maybe it was a year ago, year and a half ago, mm-hmm. um, following the Barcelona model. I've yet to hear anything about that. I hope it's open and succeeding and thriving. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would be thinking, since I haven't heard anything since, that it hasn't gone yeah. so well. So let's hope. I mean, the Bulldog opened um, a cafe, a grand cafe in Rome. Um, maybe four years ago now, maybe five, and they're still waiting for the laws to be in a situation that allows them to even consume CBD on the premises. Yeah. And I hope that changes. Um, yeah. So these sort of things are very slow to move, and if they move, like we said, like any country, I mean, what's the right way? We don't know the right way. What's the wrong way? Well, we know what's the wrong way. <laughs> what's the right way? What's the right way is debatable. Each country seems to have their own cultural habits, and probably each system will need to differ and they'll probably roll it out a little bit differently i don't think cbd is the gateway to thc mm-hmm. i think that cbd products are amazing um for people who don't ever want to enter the world of cannabis but want mm-hmm. to have the effects um for let's say a sore joint or a skin condition or anxiety vape pens oils topical creams etc i think those products are incredible for those non-THC consumers, um, but I do not personally think that CBD is a gateway to THC in terms of consumer usage and therefore legality. I think that's like saying coffee and tea are the same because you get them both at a cafe. You know what I mean? No, I, yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Uh, I guess the the point I was just meandering towards was sort of the religious sensibilities of the population. And the, yeah. the the harder and longer a government drags its feet, no matter, even we live under now these stupid European restrictions about news and information. So if you don't use a VPN, you get very little fucking international information, international news. So for all you've got these headlines kicking off in America and Canada and predominantly Israel about these amazing studies, all of this wondrous news and evidence around cannabis, and it just it falls deaf. But the people that want to know find out and they proliferate this information and it seeps into mass media anyway. There's now yeah. basketball players and football stars and weightlifters and MMA fighters and it's in soap operas, it's in films, you know, it's 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 perfect things the other day and one of the main characters in the latest season is the biggest stoner I've ever seen <laughs> in any series of all and he saves the day twice and I'm watching yeah. this like wow now we're heroes in yeah one of the biggest, uh, bro it, it's changing man it's mm. but the religious aspect that's a generational issue but I think you're right in the, the business side the CBD leading to THC is a legalization industry yeah I think that's a slow route. That is a very hard slog, and that requires a lot of investment, a lot of lobbying, marketing, uh, and uh, consistent pressure and, and effort. Whereas this organic growth amongst the communities of people that, that will then choose to risk it. I mean, fuck, when places in, in uh, Asia had literally firing squad for, for smuggling cannabis, guess what people were still doing every fucking day? Smuggling cannabis. People 
are going to want and choose to access it. I think it's it's the moralizing argument for me is where we can win it back. You've already got, um, he's not an Imram. My, my religious knowledge of, of Islam is terrible. Um, but it was, it was basically in the same way that uh, cannabis was then accepted as kosher. In, in uh, the Islamic faith, cannabis in some sects is then considered now not sin. It's not taboo. Halal. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not like halal, but it's like. Uh, That's uh, incredible. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, but again, it, so even the institutions themselves, obviously, you've then got places like Hinduism. Hinduism has a huge festival that they celebrate in India every year, where once a year it's about Shiva, and Shiva is the god of fucking cannabis. Do you know what I mean? Literally, so everybody just goes and you go and go to the, the 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 shamans and the people that literally all they do every day is consume cannabis, learn in not scientifically and on, on laptops and academic and study, but learn firsthand what this plant is, what it does, how it works, and, and hold this and safeguard this this historic knowledge and pass it on. You know, you think I, always, I, I, I think that that will be lost, unfortunately. I think that even the term for the word hash has been lost. I think the Frenchie yeah. Canoli was very adamant on that. And I actually see how he, through the years, progressively got more correct. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that, I don't know if these progressions in some ways are good or bad for the plant. I like that these sort of things that are still going on, but this is still very, these festivals are culture and tradition. And yet again, in a completely different bracket, of how recreational cannabis would work. Mm. It wouldn't be celebrated in that way. Well, at my house. <laughs> ritual sacrament, in a ritual sacrament um, mm. uh, capacity, but with things opening up to everybody in the world and things becoming legal, the dynamic changes and everything changed. Like it changed in California. Like it, it's gone, mm. there's yoga cannabis classes in California now. Whereas 15 years ago, even 25 years ago, it was a bunch of hippies smoking weed in the top, top 215 days and sharing weed amongst themselves and selling it was like taboo. Yeah. You know, so let's enjoy those things where we can. Let's go to these festivals. Yeah. Let's embrace the culture while it's still the way it is because it's changing every single year. But we, and, this, yeah. that, that's the, his, the long history. So obviously, thank God. I'm trying to read the sign in my head and I can't. Uh, a small village in Australia. Uh, Nibbin. Thank you. I, yeah, I was going to say no. Nibia in my head and I was like, it's definitely not Nibia. It's definitely not Nibia. It's definitely not Nibia. Um, yeah, yeah. Same, yeah. And so there are all these spots in these places. Like before, obviously, what happened with the fucking Hells Angels and the whole grenade incident, there was Free Time Christiania as well, Denmark. Yeah. There are these. It's still going on. It's still going on, huh? I mean... Yeah, it's, it's obviously more reduced in terms of the, the or from again you can never really trust mass media from the mass media i've absorbed no one of the boys yeah, face still there, but... there one of the boys facetime me from there the other day uh, didn't still... show me the... yeah i mean he's look if anyone knows the dude like cutter smoking hagen yeah that's right. the dude in christiania and he's, he's right. told me he's still thriving thankfully so uh, i'm happy to hear that all right writes denmark is place to visit on list. yeah dude, that's <laughs> exactly why i say it man when i heard that i was like yo i gotta go there and he's yeah. telling me i gotta go there so that's yeah. on the list mm -hmm. now yeah those are the places nimbins christiania mm -hmm. um i mean there's a few little places in Ireland i don't want to name them um people know where they are uh amsterdam is in one sense the same in one because it is very very small i mean it's, mm -hmm. it's absolutely tiny if you think about it um yeah. and even like what i was surprised was the canary islands recently mm. the canary islands wow like like that's becoming a real cannabis haven i mm. mean it's it's like yeah. walking down the strip in la it's signage it's terraces it's mm -hmm. you know one place even has jacuzzis on their outdoor terrace I mean, that was, it's the it's the understanding of the the different tourists that attracts and yeah there are complications to having tourism in any region but you would far rather have a population of cannabis consumers they're going to spend a fuck ton of money on food than all these guys whiting up and causing fights and getting in troubles and glassing each other and that's an overgeneralization but if you look at statistics <laughs> you just got to walk down the farmer start in amsterdam and look at how they got rid of all the coffee shops mm. and now it's just like constant fights and mm. being people, on, people peeing on corners and empty bottles and empty plastic cups the whole street um and it used to be for yeah. the coffee shops it's, so the, it's, it's the, beautiful. 
Yeah, it's the vibe and the energy. And my point was that there are these places that have stood as havens through the worst of prohibition. Guess what we're going to do now? We're going to build our own havens. Do you know how many people are uh, intending to set up retreats and hotels and different hostel models and also people are branching out? Some of the concept models I've heard from people that I connect with around the world are like, fuck me, that is amazing. Why has no one thought of that? Um, and they'll get the financing as well. They'll get the funding for it. Mm -hmm. like, because when this goes yeah. legal, people will see this as the newest consumer mm -hmm. commodity item that's hot and they're going to want to invest. And I'm seeing yeah. that already like, yeah. I mean, I'm from people I talk to doing proposals that, you know, people want to pitch or people who need funding for this or that. It's 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 coming. It's there. I mean, people are, as you yeah. say, the concepts are incredible. I hope I hope the legality allows them to do what they want to do because well, these it, aren't just waiting. Some of these people are waiting 20, yeah. 30 years you know. Even if it even if it doesn't, this is what I'm really excited to see is clubs and coffee shops are a byproduct of prohibition. So this new pro whatever happens with legalization, it's gonna be a limited system. There will always then be, oh, you only allow 10 plants. So guess what? Fuck ton of people are gonna go to prison for going 12 plants. You only allow four ounces on the street, this guy's gonna get go to prison because he had four and a half. There's still gonna be these gray areas and we'll still as legacy, a lot of the legacy people will still occupy them. Even if they it, skirt both areas and crisscross back and forth, the, the yeah. culture I think will always fall towards those those edges because we don't wanna to be told what to do. We want that opportunity to create these spaces. So I think that there will be, again, the same way you'd go to the coffee shops or the, the clubs in, in Barcelona. And it's such a different flavor and vibe in each spot. It's it's distilled of the energy of the people that have created it and the the members that frequent it, yeah, like any hotel or bar or restaurant or yeah. I mean, some people go to a restaurant for the food. I go there for the for the for the ambience, the, the service, it's the collective food, experience. Very, yeah. For me, it is yeah, completely. That's 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 mm -hmm. very very important. You can enjoy a meal an awful lot more. Imagine how much that affects your joint smoking, weed smoking experience. With, as you said, edibles and the environment is crap, man. That's going to be a crap experience. Well, as you, you know? said about being uncomfortable in coffee shops, it, it's the same sort of thing. If, whereas if you've got that comfort, you spoke of before about uh, almost the, we spoke of like the dying rituals. Say so it was like the festival that I can't remember the name of. Sorry, uh, I'll make a note to try and put it in the, in the comments below. Um, but we have our own sort of rituals in that right, we'll grab the skins, grab a weed grinder, sit down, have I got a drink? got my tray you know some people have a box you know I, I had a box for about 15 years that literally i couldn't roll up without putting that in the box flipped open and everything was organized and there's there's our individualistic rituals and i think that we now as legality change the law changes and leg new legislation comes on board we're gonna organically find these new ceremonies these new gatherings we've obviously always had 420 and now we've, we've onboarded 710 which are, the americans and the brits can't really do decide which way we're going to celebrate that right now but we'll figure that one out as we go forward do it twice <laughs> yeah exactly do it fucking twice uh but there will be a, a my hope is there'll be a cannabis liberation day a july 4th for the world where the un that day probably fucking 20 years from now but at some point when the un eventually gets that the piece of paper and goes right 99.6 percent of the countries now sell weed do we actually yeah, right. get rid of this now that i think and there's you know? If we have steak and blowjob day, we get at least four twenty. <laughs> I think it's I think it's only fair. You know, I there's agree. some crazy holidays out there. National this day, national that day. You could be onto mm -hmm. something, my friend. Let's make yeah. that let's make, let's make that happen. Definitely, because four twenty is the old, like I said is the old celebration. We need a celebration of what we've won so far and what we want to win. The complacency is falling in a lot of areas. It's, there's so many people that in American states that are like looking at over the fence going. Any day now, any day now. And it's like, well, what are you doing to make that day now? Yeah. In every capacity. I see it all around the, the world, obviously. I've, I struggle myself to, to, to keep pushing barriers. I, I'm just pushing buttons, I guess, most days. But I'm still just trying to advance the argument, the conversation, but all of it. I don't want a, a CBD industry without everything else. I don't want a rec market and adult consumers market without the decriminalization of everybody for everything. Unless I can fill my flat with it, like every square inch, we sat literally having to peer through plants to you guys now and be protected legally as long as I pay my fucking bills, don't steal my electric and whatever, then the war isn't over. Do you know what I mean? I can I can sit here now, I can drink myself to death live on this fucking stream on a fucking throne of crates and there is no restriction or limitation there. It's down to my you autonomy. Even, you wouldn't even get your flagged. You wouldn't even get... If you were live streaming, I don't think they'd even stop you. <laughs> exactly. I don't think the algorithm would like even acknowledge it. 
exactly but until burner's project or until whatever comes to light where we get an un uh, censored social media space where we can show what our culture is to each other and create that stronghold and identify each other and be millions strong, then we're, we're kind of fucked. We're kind He's of fucked. Doing the best he can. Burner's doing the best he can, man, with the, with, with the TV network as well, the Couch Lock network, and mm. with, with Social Club as well, like you just uh, adhere to. Like, yeah, these people are doing the best they can with the position that they have in the industry. and. I, it brings me back. I had one moment. I had many moments uh, that I remember vividly in my head with with Hank, the the, the founder of the Bulldog, mm -hmm. and the owner of the Bulldog, Hank De Vries, um, who I put in the same league as Burner and, and some of these other people because he really, and people, most people aren't aware of this, like, but Hank really fought for the coffee shops. So him and his friends were locked up like every day, like they were singing to the police station, knowing they couldn't be held for for too long because of the laws, but. They were locked up every single day. Like he bought the police station they used to lock him up in. That's the Bulldog Palace now. Yeah. You know that's, what I mean? That's, that's bad, man. That's a that's a G. So when Spen yeah. when I spoke, I listened and, and it was always great. Um and one time we were having a, a dinner in Germany uh, with all of our uh, key accounts and distributors and everyone who key key people from the Bulldog basically at a, at a very big exhibition. We had a nice dinner afterwards in a very nice location and we rented the whole place out. It was it was very tastefully done. And Hank just lights up a joint. And I'm like, okay, it's a it's a badass move. We're in Germany. Like, this is a very swanky place. Mm -hmm. And I said it to him after like, yo, like respect for lighting that joint because all the rest of us are wondering if we could do it. And he said, Well, look, look, I'm an old man, I'm a wealthy man. If I can't light a joint in these places, who can? So I may as well do it to push the agenda forward for you guys so you can do it quicker. Mm -hmm. Because they're not going to come to me and say, hey, you can't do that. He knows he can do it. They're not going to say nothing to him. Mm -hmm. And let's all just move on with the conversation. It's not a problem for anybody. And he used his position to make it better for all of us. Yeah. And that's what a lot of us should be doing if we have that position. And it's not because it's the moral thing to do or whatever. It's the right thing to do because the plant has given us so much. Yeah. And you've got to give it back. I believe in karma. Mm. Right? I think you have to in today's world. But like, do the best you can. Like, I can't honestly say I'm anywhere close to the position like that. I can't even imagine that being right. But if I was in that position, I would be doing stuff like what the um, evidence bag company are doing and the last prisoner project and these sort of people. I mean, that's really nice to see. And I hope we can bring projects like that to Europe, you know? Yeah, sure. And those sort of things are, are, we are obligated to do so. I put it that way. Exactly that. I mean, I think the evidence bag is, is brilliant for anyone that hasn't seen sort of their, their packaging and their marketing. And it is just a, a constant reminder of the ongoing war of the history of this. This isn't some magic thing that was discovered by a bunch of, you know, white guys behind the back of a shed, like, oh, Terence, come here, look, we found this magical plant. It can solve all these world's problems. We've been here for decades, for fucking centuries. There have been activists, advocates, at some point put to fucking death by firing squad to keep this knowledge and this shit alive. So this brings us on quite beautifully, actually, to a topic I wanted to get your opinion on. Um, for my British and European friends that haven't really heard, <laughs> heard the term, the Americans have coined a term called CHAD, or the collective plural being CHADs, for inexperienced individuals that were never involved in the legacy of cannabis, that never consumed it, never backed it, in a lot of instances actually vilified, demonized, and were part of the stigma of it when it was criminalized, and now owning businesses, investing into it and trying to, you know, smooth on the shores and pretend like they, they know anything about the culture, about the plant. Uh, so being someone that's traveled a lot, worked in a lot of circles, uh, I just want to get, get your opi opinion on, on, on chads and sorry to any chads out there that happen to listen to my podcast. Yeah, Chad, chads, um, chads exist, definitely. <laughs> shapes and sizes from all corners of the planet. They can be male or female, they can be young, they can be old, they can be black, white, yellow, green, purple, they, they come in every shape I've seen. Mm. Um, one common denominator I've seen with these people is uh, the misconception that stoners are stupid, 
So they come into the industry thinking they can automatically resolve issues, help, or be the best employee in the business because they are not stoners. So they see it as a strength, mm -hmm. as a huge strength. So this is how normal business, I, I mean, I saw an American one day go into a coffee shop and talk to a coffee shop owner about running an algorithm so that he could stock jars correctly with the labels of the weed and he would know how many jars he needs to stock for each weed. So if someone bought silver bubble or lemon haze, they would need X amount of jars for each one because the algorithm says this is how much you're gonna sell. Mm -hmm. These sort of Chads and Brads don't understand anything about the industry to even come up with these sort of scenarios. They make the best the best thing I've seen in terms of sales and analytics is is data. Mm -hmm. So there's companies that sell cannabis data. I'm not going to name them because they probably have 7,000 lawyers who also know nothing about cannabis, mm -hmm. um, but they are very big. And it first word starts with P and the second word starts with P and they're both big words. <laughs> uh, very expensive yes. data, by the way. Yes. Um, uh, I think uh, my audience uh, have heard <laughs> me be annoyed at these individuals before. Well, I've seen companies pitch these individuals data that says that France is the number one consumer of cannabis in Europe and that towns like Lyon are the center where their marketing should be and stock should be, yeah, we should import this amount of stock because there's this amount of smokers and this. this and the problem with all this data is, man, like I'm a very proud smoker, but if some random chad comes up to me on the street with a form and says, hi, do you smoke cannabis? How many cannabis joints do you smoke per day? Do you like CBD? I'm going to say, hi, no, goodbye, ciao. Like, that's it's, a no on the form. Like, yeah, you know? even the question of it will be, if cannabis was legal here, would you? It's going to be one of those kind of lead questions. It's not, not gonna, it's not about getting not, the actual data for the market now because they already understand that this doesn't translate. Look, they pitched in 2017 and 2018, they pitched, I said they, the grand they, the, the figure that was brought out, I believe... Don't quote me on this, folks. Don't, don't at me. I believe at the time it was something to do with uh, the CMC, the Centre for uh, Med Medical Cannabis here in the UK. Uh, they said 1.4 million medicinal consumers here in the UK. There was 1.4 illegal people accessing cannabis for medicinal reasons. And they that's what they pitched, allegedly, huge allegedly here, folks, um, to the Canadian investors and those companies when they were coming in saying, we will give you 1.4 million consumers you bring all this money and help us to get this law changed and rally allegedly, allegedly rally and change this law. Um, and then, yeah, you get access to this market. It's now coming up four years later and we're still shy of 20,000. Yeah. I, um, I don't know where these people get the data from. I know they're used to using data to you to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an unregulated market. This is a new product to 95% mm -hmm. of the consumers are trying to attract um it is a whole educational aspect that probably requires time in school for the next generations because if you want to educate people on cannabis and drugs that is not something that can be done overnight um yeah man like mm -hmm. the chads are there they exist they are very prominent in some of your favorite brands they come and they go some stay unfortunately um but behind every good brand out there are some loyal ass people who are the complete opposite of that. And we all know those are the people that make this thing tick. But let's just hope there's not too many chads get involved in what we've previously been discussing and we can actually use the people who have been speaking for the last 20, 25, 30 years in some cases to um, to make sure that they are on whatever council on board sitting there with the chads to tell the chads to shut up. They don't know what they're talking about and call them on their bullshit. Yeah. I know about the, the the cannabis community. We we like to call people on their bullshit. Um, you know, it's it's not a problem. So I, I just need to know that we're going to be included in whatever conversations, and hope that the right person is included. Yeah. Exactly that. A joint a day keeps the chads away. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Teach it out of there. We will drop a link in the description. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. Buy merch. Buy merch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you you spot on and exactly that. I use um uh a, a kind of statement a, a piece of rhetoric that was created during the civil rights movement which is nothing about us without us you know we are the consumers 
you yeah. you can't build an industry regulate and say this is for you guys if you don't consult with us because there's one thing their data sets all of it with these uh uh, I'm not going to allude any further who those individuals are, but with the data sets of large companies like that and the ones that they themselves are then pitching to these huge companies, uh, these investment international conglomerates, again, not going to name for same legal reasons, um, is missing one key variable. <clears throat> Fuck you ability. The, the, yeah. the, 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 how would you just, yeah, the, the fuck you nature of cannabis consumers to go, no, I don't care. Yeah, you sell it on my street corner. It's McDonald's. It's the end of my street. I'm still going to go to my house. I'm still going to go to Dave down the street who's been helping me for 15 fucking years. They can't understand that mentality of our, not even tribalism, but it's protectionism that we know you will not be the boot on our throat for decades and suddenly step off, give us a hand up and go, do you want to buy it? Like that, that's, that's not what we're down for, man. No, the best brands in the industry reflect the right people. Mm -hmm. for that reason i mean there's really crappy brands out there and they're run by really crappy people who don't care about this plant and would probably lobby you know the incorrect way shall we say um if they were given choices because they're just so uneducated on the whole place and i do like to think that that's something that me myself in the small capacity that i do for the certain brands that i work with or whatever project i may be on i do like to think of myself as speaking from the consumer's mindset and from the I mean, I said, fuck you on many phone calls. Like, like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. this is absurd. I actually said it this morning um, to a colleague at a particular brand because there was something I saw and I was like, this is just, I'm not kosher with this at all. And um, so, yeah, we, we, yeah, you need, you need the consumers to be involved. And that will not be done by this type of data analysis that they, certain companies are doing. Mm -hmm. This has to be done by social media at the very, very least um, trade show exhibitions where you interact with consumers and you talk to them and you discuss your product and they discuss their point of view and you can see yeah. and, and directly where I'm a big, big firm believer in that. Mm -hmm. Most companies see it as an expense. I see it as like a multitude of things all the way up to like R&D. You yeah. know, it, it it's, it's, an, it's a necessity ultimately at the end of the day. If you're going to design a product that then people aren't going to want, you can launch a deal with your branding to put all this money together and then people still turn their nose about it. I mean, yeah. there, was, there were companies like, uh, I don't even say like Raw is an interesting example, like with what they do with their social media content, they basically get feedback from their customers, go, oh, did you, if you do use it this way, you can do this. And they're just spreading of information that is of how their consumers are using it back to other consumers to ensure more consumption. So it's from a business I point. Right now, I can tell you right now, and I'm not going to get specific, but I can tell you right now that persons involved in that do some very, very nasty business that I can guarantee you your followers would not agree with. And therefore would not support that product. And it's one of the main reasons I represent their competition and put so much blood, sweat and tears into it. And I will tell you offline, my friend. I was going to say I'd appreciate a, a quiet conversation because I'm, uh, yeah, yeah I'm not going to put that on record, but I'm due a conversation with somebody actually. So that would appre I'd appreciate the heads up. I, um, I've seen it firsthand before I joined um, Vibes. Um, it was actually came up in my interview, um, like what do you think of? I was got very passionate, like, yo, okay, yeah, yeah, very Irish and passionate in that scenario. And I uh, believe it helped me in my interview all those years back. But uh, I felt like that for a long time over certain things, being in the industry, whatever. That's one of the reasons why I won't even have the products um, on my table. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's uh, that's a big thing for me. Um, okay, uh, yeah, we're allowed to. We can be fooled and tricked. Also, uh, we are consumers. Um, in, in, indeed, indeed. I, I picked Raw as just one of the ubiquitous brands that people would kind of know. Um, you do but, the marketing, by the way. The marketing is like next level. Huh? I mean, the products also, and the speed at which they turn around. Yeah. Unbelievable. The education he does, I, I really respect that. Like, I would never even go down the, the route of mimicking it because I respect it so much. Mm -hmm. uh, it is his style and is extremely unique, and the brand is, is, is successful because of that. So all respect from a business perspective on that. Mm -hmm. Personally, I have a different viewpoint. As does, Burner, as does Burner, I believe, from multiple it, videos. 
Interesting. Well, I would like, yeah, if you would uh, perhaps yeah, share the information with me, I'd like to do sort of a deep dive myself. And my beef is different to Burner's beef, just for the record. So, okay, yeah. it's a different yeah. opinion. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, the more you know, folks. Uh, so I suppose that's sometimes, sometimes ignorance is bliss. Uh, sometimes you just want to enjoy your joint and not care about the politics, and they can appreciate that too. I remember being an ignorant consumer decades ago and then finding out where my weed came from and the child labor that was involved in a region close to me. And it, it broke my fucking heart. And that's what started me on Grow Your Own Journey. And I believe that if it can be destroyed by the truth, it probably deserves to be destroyed by the truth. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, it comes with maturity, though. Yeah. It's, yeah. So I'm still maturing as these fine folks that listen to this podcast will tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Episodes deep, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I suppose, yeah, from definitely, but this far wrong. Uh, I suppose this brings on quite nicely, actually, then to uh, these main three points and just kind of, kind of conglomerate all into one. This uh, marketing sort of tricks and, and gimmicks and these, these traditional advertising, um, well, yeah, tricks that have been sort of used in mass marketing for decades and now being applied to sort of to cannabis and we're now seeing obviously the i call it the hype, the, the hype train and obviously this is perpetuated highly by social media by i suppose the kind of you could argue the weaponization of influencers um but obviously as somebody that has worked um as you, you spoke of earlier for, for for a company in sort of this space and have now set up your own company i just wanted kind of your your, your thoughts on on hype and the gimmicks and the tricks that are at the ploy and kind of as someone that as we've learned over this podcast has lived and operated in this industry for a hell of a long time what makes you i guess different from from what sort of else is out there the, the chads of the world and uh, me personally you mean like as against you you yeah. and your company yeah well hype is important i have no problem with hype um i think that there's a very limited tool selection of tools in the arsenal that you can use for marketing and cannabis because of legality because i mean social media isn't even perfect i mean some of the best growers i know have like five six hundred followers because they're farmers they don't use social media they're growing weed so um it's all about using what you can to reach the consumers and with more i suppose spend in the industry comes more attention to the industry and with more new consumer reach, you are more inclined to have more usage consistently and therefore more potential medical patients, recreational patients, whatever, whatever it may be. So I know personally that like, it wasn't for the hype of edibles and vapes and things like that, there would be a large portion of people who would not be consuming cannabis in any capacity right now. And I think that hype has, has really helped with that because it's promotion. I have no problem with anyone promoting their business. I want everybody to go make their money. Like, you know what I mean? There's lines that should not be crossed. I mean, like, I'm, I'm not going to get specific on it, but certain lines are crossed by certain individuals and um, when it comes to marketing. But in general, I think influencers are in a very privileged position because they are one of those tools in the arsenal. Um, not to speak very bluntly of it, but social media influencers, um, newsletters, these are, are, are the things we can use. Um, but having a good solid network of the real influencers and the real cannabis consumers, um, that, that makes the difference. I mean, I do a lot of promotions with a lot of people for a lot of brands. I do not give a lot of people money because a lot of people want to represent those products or those brands or they want to use them. Mm -hmm. So I'm always happy to give someone something that they want and they're going to use. Yeah. I don't ever tell someone, I want this from you, I want that from you. And if we're doing a contract and a, and a six months, whatever, for promotions, extremely rare for myself. It's more the case of, hey, you know, would you like to try this product? Like the best example is when I was working with Stunden Glass. So stunning class, the gravity bomb. Yeah. There was a load of people wanted that for their music studio, for their social club with their friends, whatever. Like that's the best sort of promotion I can do. Mm -hmm. Please take that product. Go enjoy that product. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? And then when it comes to doing whatever next or whatever, let's work together on the next one. And over the years, I've built a very nice network of really nice, honest people. Mm. And they are personal friends of mine, I like to think. Um, unfortunately, I don't see some as much as I'd like to see them, especially since I moved away. Um, but those relationships have been nurtured over years and they're mutual and it's a little bit different to hi here is a list of people with these amount of followers that you can work with and they cost this 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 and this like you're buying groceries or something mm -hmm. it doesn't work like that every product and every brand and every influencer has a different dynamic and it's called connecting the dots between them to get the ultimate goal the ultimate goal is to have someone actively enjoying your product while simultaneously creating content that promotes your brand mm -hmm. That is the win-win for everybody for me. So for me, I like to do that a lot. Um, I've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> you know, this is the Bulldog. Um, for the Bulldog, it was a case of, you're in town, would you like to get high? We would like to host you. Yeah. All we need is a picture for our social media, which is cool for everybody. Mm -hmm. And people loved it. And Greenhouse have been doing it for years and other coffee shops do it. And it it's a great, it's a win-win for everybody. I, I have no problem with that. Um, it's not like I don't think we're going to go down the route of like cosmetic adverts in the UK. You know, there was that expose on these people selling drinks that were um, containing illegal ingredients and people promoting things that are de essentially detrimental to your health. Yeah, I have no problem with someone promoting a vaporizer, or a grinder, or a paper. My conscience is clean on that. I'm, I'm happy to do it for people and for brands. And I'm happy that everyone should be happy by the end of the, the mm -hmm. The, the deal or whatever it may be you know what i mean yeah man. Um, on top of that i mean just having enough time in the industry and being to over 50 cannabis trade shows around the years and working with like 19 or 20 different brands um, and arguably the largest uh, coffee shop in, in holland and the largest dispensary company in america and, and bulldog and, and cookies respectively respectively it's i've learned a lot in a very short period of time what i think is 10 years because some people are mm -hmm. fighting this battle 30, 40 years. But learning from some of the best people in the industry really helped, especially uh, in Green Lane too, there's some really great people there. So just taking that along with being a real consumer um, and, and, and as passionate of, of, a, of a businessman as I can be in my capacity about the plant, trying to steer these companies and these brands in the right direction to reach the right people. Mm -hmm. So at the end, everybody wins, you know? Yeah. Good, good be example. I mean, like, I would love to give you all of my brands. You don't do this, so I, 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 never approach. I would love to give you all of my brands because you are, in my opinion, one of the most authentic cannabis people in the UK. And therefore, that is a perfect representation of particular brands that I represent. Mm -hmm. So that's a win-win for everybody if you were going to, let's say, use those papers or use that gravity bong. Or use well, paper. I, I think in I think in uh, we're gonna have to have a conversation about what papers I use go forward by the looks of it. So yeah, uh, I might need a, a nice <laughs> selection of See, this is this is why I like doing what I like doing. Yeah, it's, we it's, it's, papers mm -hmm. and we have the conversation. I would love to be the guy to give you those papers, and I would then love you to give those papers to your friends. Mm -hmm. And this is what it's about. Yeah, you know, it's, like, it's that it's that organic growth. Uh, I mean, like it's. Yeah, the only thing that I really worry about or the reason the hype bothers me is the way it's manipulated in the legacy or criminalized market. So as soon as then a brand is popular in California, the Mylar bags are replicated and sold on Amazon in the UK, for example. You know what yeah. I mean? It, it's For example, it's cookies bags. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of cookies products that end up in the UK. And a lot of just, I mean... I think I've told this anecdote on the podcast before, but I've stood in farms in America, in Cali, that I'm not going to name obvious, for obvious reasons. And they've explained the process that they themselves didn't state that they used, but they alleged that others did in the area where a box for just a standard unit, a kilo, uh, fucking fails a test. It goes in the bin, you fill out a form, you get the tax back, you write it off at the end of the year as well. It's not really a loss to you. That box goes in the air quotes bin. There's then an entire, obviously, sub-market of individuals, as we spoke of earlier, that then sell it to other states. But then there's obviously an international export market. And it's getting weird. We're now seeing Cali packs, genuine Cali packs, being smuggled into Mexico. So drugs are going the other way in, in America and Mexico, which is interesting. Yeah. It shows, shows the strength of, uh, of brand marketing and of, of the product. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see that 
yeah the, the people want obviously what they're seeing is a good brand so obviously they see something in another region they want it that obviously creates supply there is no demand because of Ill illegality so therefore demand is then filled by the criminal market space some of them are decent some of them are obviously fucking not some yes some no for sure um in my opinion, I'm happier that it's not the deep, deep aspects of organized crime that are getting involved in mm. smuggling, because that was always the case, at least where I grew up. Mm -hmm. I live on, I live on an island that has a terrible climate for growing cannabis, so mm -hmm. you can be assured that most of it is smuggled in. And I, I don't think any of the boys that we know are going driving the truck from A to B full of, yeah. uh, that, that's a different element of, mm. of crime so i have no problem with anyone making their money i really don't um i think that if it wasn't for a hype we wouldn't also know about a lot of strains i smoked skittles for the yeah. first time on product earth like six years ago mm -hmm. and i will never forget that moment mm -hmm. and the only reason i i saved it to my last joint i remember it vividly as my best friend jack um smoking in the streets don't recommend it um but it was just before i got on my flight and it was the last joint we had, and it blew my mind. And the dude who gave it to me hyped it. Mm. Like, he could have sold ice to an Eskimo, this guy. <laughs> he was right. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. It's when they hype and they don't back it up. That's the problem. Bro. That's that. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's, yeah, if it's, if it's hype from somebody from Legacy or someone that's been around, I suppose it's different. Whereas if it's then, what's a criminal chad? I need to figure that one out <laughs> because there are cannabis dealers and people that sell cannabis that don't consume cannabis so they, you will hear that i hear it from the grow shops a lot of times where they'll buy a product and the person in the grow shop will go you do know that that will do xyz that's you know an additive and the person goes i don't care i don't i don't smoke it i don't use it that's that's always going to be the case no i mean mm. people don't want to make money off something well it's illegal when it's legal, I'm not sure how many of these people will be involved. There will always be, I mean, there's always one, right? Like, yeah. always something gonna, you know, I think when it's legal, you're not going to have that issue so much, to be perfectly honest with you. It depends on the boundaries, because if you look at California right yeah. now, and right now, Steve D'Angelo, when he was on the podcast, said 80% uh, of the Californian market is serviced by the illegal market right now. Only 20% of the population buy lawfully. Because of taxation. Yeah, yeah, because of the price. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, that's it's the limitations on on the way that the the models work. Where, whereas yeah. then, if sorry, go on. I think that Corona enhanced yeah. it though, Massive. because everyone Actually, yeah, found I suppose plug, massively. Yeah. yeah, everyone found a plug. Like, I mean, if you look at the concentrates market alone uh, in Spain, from from my understanding, a lot of people are just buying from the plug now, a plug, like mm -hmm. as in a person. Yeah. instead of going to the traditional dispensary social club, whatever it may be, because it's an expensive product and they can get it from the plug. So why are they? Yeah. So Corona really, I know it affected numbers in Amsterdam too. Um, but yeah, people, people now have their way to get weed and that probably goes double for countries that don't have access to cannabis. I'm sure these guys mm -hmm. are landing packs every day. And good for them if they're excited and hyped about that pack that's going to land them. They get to enjoy it that bit more and good for them. And if they're tricked and fooled and cool, man, leave them. Once they're not smoking absolute booth that's going to like destroy their lungs, like good for them, you know. Mm. But then in the dispensaries in the US and wherever there's booth coming out of them too, they pass all the testing. So, yeah, grow your own, grow, grow your own, man. You know what I mean? Do your own thing, support yourself, support your people around you, support your local community. And if you want to get it with a Cali every once in a while and get that fancy pack, then go do it. If you want to go on holidays and smoke them for five days and then go back to your local stuff, go do it. If you want to import your own stuff all day long, feel free, man, but spending a lot of money on, on minor packs. Um, you know, each to their own. Just get your medicine, whatever makes you happy. Just try not to hurt anybody in the process and make sure you're buying from the right people because in Ireland... I was dealing with the wrong people a lot of the time. And I know my friends mm -hmm. nowadays dealing with the wrong people. I get a lot of messages every day from people I don't even know. Hi, I'm in this part of Spain. Hi, I'm in wherever. Do you know where I can get? I would love, if I can, to help those people and get them to the right place so they don't end up getting robbed on the street. You know what yeah. I mean? I get that watch stolen or a phone stolen or 
God forbid they're with their partner and something happens. That's horrible, man. Mm-hmm. Don't want that to happen to anybody. So yeah, and yeah, it's do it like that. So self-regulation through, I guess, wherever you kind of you vote with your dollar sort of thing, you know, uh, that can't, same kind of fuck you ability that we were speaking uh, speaking of before needs to kind of yeah, be applied to our own domestic cultures and uh, scenes as well. Because, I mean, as you said, I I stopped signposting, signposting people to people a while ago because I... I can't make that decision for somebody else. I, I can't verify somebody, no matter even if I've known them for years and whatever else, I can't know if they uh, the, went missing in the post, if they no, tried to scam this person, if they did X, Y, I, so I just, it's one of those really heartbreaking things that I forget. And it's one of the things I'm trying to be mindful of with this new series I'm producing. <clears throat> and some people in the UK, they don't, the only access they have is some fucking real dodgy kid on a bike attached to some gang network that will fucking burn your house down if you ask, oh, there's a seeds in this. Like, they don't have what I would have been lucky enough to live in for the past 10 plus years, which is honest, open relationships with other growers, with people in, in coffee shops, in fucking clubs, in different levels of networks. And my own ability to discern and, to, and yeah, to have access to go, no, I don't want that. I'm going to go look at someone else and... Some people don't. They get cannabis. There's still a lot of people in this country that only buy cannabis. They buy an eighth or a 20 bag of cannabis. They're never told what it is. They never learn anything about the terpenes, how different cultivars affect them. And they never really know. They just know that, oh, that one fucked me up, that one didn't, so it was dink. And it's like, well, no, that was probably a different terpene profile and different cannabinoids. And And most of those people had a joint of amnesia after five or six pints. And they ditched them mentally. And I'm like, that's, yeah. It all comes with education, my friend. Yeah, but I mean, it's we we are the ones to do this because, as I've pointed out in the first episode of this new series, the Great Medical Cannabis Con, the the doctors are now prescribing under false information. So they're saying that oh well, this ratio of CBD to THC will do this to you. No, you can't yeah. know that. Scientifically, our endocannabinoids are as unique as fingerprints. You can take data, you can buy it from your P, meh, P meh, company and say, oh, well, according to this, 10,000 people have a 5% chance of this, 30% chance of this, and that's what they're prescribing to you based on. You need a profile yeah. done of how individual terpenes, sequestered terpenes, fucking flavonoids, and the other compounds in whole plant products affect you. And when no, the only place that's even close to that is a few private uh, companies in Israel who are trying to understand that actually if we can map your genome and you're effectively, what do they call it now, the endocannabinoid hub or like the, the larger thing than the system itself that they're now understanding, that you can map this and then go, actually, say beta carophylline for you will do this. Lemonine will do this. And that yeah. is when it's scientific. For now, it is just guesstimation. So you should yeah. know if you, you then know if, all right, if I smoke dogs, Anything with dog in makes me do this. Me, for example, anything with blueberry in, anything that you bleed, bl- breed blueberry in, I am the single calmest, most anxiolytic s- substance in the world. You could come at me with a knife and I'll be like, all right, two minutes, let me finish this joint. Um, yeah, it's yeah. just, it's chill. I am just woof. And so that I know that when I'm anxious and I, I want to get, I'll look for something blue. I'll look at the lineage of whatever's around and try and find that within its genetics. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? And that's yeah, that, the same with blue cheese. Blue cheese does exist. And I was smoking blue cheese from my very first trip in Amsterdam. It was like one of the first five or six weeks I tried. And I was smoking it for years. And I went back every time I smoked from the same place in the Bluebird coffee shop. Maybe they still have it. Smoked it every time. And then one day, some friend five, six years later showed me Leafly. I looked on Leafly and I looked at the effects, listed effects on the plant. Just this is the most basic way that you could map yourself at the time. To, mm-hmm. to cannabis genetics and it was like extremely calm if i was to read the list of what i described the cannabis plant as it was exactly what i wanted from cannabis mm-hmm. and i was like yep that's me like straight up like just on a, on a on a written basic research basis which is probably changed by now but i i i knew myself personally that that was the strain for me and still is this day i can never find it done man. i need someone to grow some. well it's if interesting Spain is listening please grow some blue cheese you, you mentioned uh, cheese earlier as well, actually. Uh, for all its very contentious history, nobody shout at me, but one of the people who says that they produced the original cheese in the UK, uh, Big Butter, is releasing, uh, re-releasing cheese yeah. seeds this year. I, I so, heard that. So one new brand, right? What, sorry? 
it's a new brand, right? He's released under a new brand name, I believe. Ah, I wasn't yeah, aware I of that. Think it's under the original seed bank name. I could be mistaken there, but I believe they are relaunching. Interesting. Cause, so then if there's obviously going to be a groundswell of, of excitement for cheese again, as we start to see the Americans love cheese as well, uh, as they label it UK cheese, um, then maybe we would see blue cheese back on the market again. Obviously, maybe not. We'd have to fennel hunt to find what we used to have. Because, I mean, for people, a lot of my listeners, I and look at my analytics, you're, you, some years are quite young. You might, not to condescend, but you might not remember pre-Stardog and Hayes and all this shit. It was cheese and blue cheese. There was just, it was cheese was every fuck everywhere to the point of everyone was shitting on cheese. It was like, oh, cheese, I hate cheese. No, And it was the thing, it was, you were cool to not like cheese. You know what I mean? And the same way people are now like, I don't like Stardog just for the sake of saying that they don't like the thing that's popular. They're being a, a contrarian. Um, but yeah, so then those mothers were destroyed, obviously, during all the raids and the networks broke down and hopefully... Maybe there is a man kicking out there and it, it could proliferate again and demand and hype. And as you say, we've said cheese enough in this that maybe a couple of other people are like, yeah, cheese, cheese, cheese. Please, Mr. Big put a cheese, bring it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll pass, pass him a note when we see him at Product Earth, but like, please bring the cheese, the blue cheese. I will back. definitely go by. I will be begging for, uh, yeah, yeah mm. for, to do, uh, for do that. Yeah. Le- Leafy's an interesting one. You, sorry, I've go got on. to, I've got to, I've got to go soon. I got, a, I got my meeting. All right. Uh, uh, we can wrap it up. Like, I mean, we can do it. If you got a question left, or what, you have? Uh, no, we don't. Let's yeah, let's let's kind of wrap up. I suppose I'll put one the last I'm question. Sorry. No, no, you you cool. You cool man. It's for product hurt. You're busy. You're a busy man. Tell him I said hi. <laughs> um, I, I will see him. They'll be there with me. Magical butter guy will be there with me. Sweet, sweet. Um, so I guess then we'll kind of push what is usually my last question, which is what does the future hold for you? With uh, so what brands do you hope to work with in the future? And kind of so, yeah. What does the future hold and what do you kind of hope to achieve within this space? vague there, but we'll do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah cool. Go, go on and ask a question again there. <laughs> um, so what does the future hold for you and what sort of brands do you want to work with? What sort of areas do you want to move into? What sort of places do you want to visit? You know, where, where do you see yourself moving in, in the future with, with cannabis? Um, I mean... It's developing right now. I'm starting to work with a number of brands that personally I have a lovely relationship with and people I really want to to work with. Um, and that I won't name too many of them right now because that's constantly an ever changing scenario. But uh, I'll see you at Product Earth and uh, hopefully we'll take some nice pictures um, and smoke many joints. But continuing my work with Cookies and Vibes for sure. Um, and I've, I'm doing some trade shows at the moment and some marketing with Magical Butter, who have a, have a great team of, of lovely people. They've actually done some really nice marketing in the UK previously. I just hope mm-hmm. to like build on that and do more trade shows with them. And we just did Mary Jane Berlin as well, which is a which is a really fun show. Really mm-hmm. great to see that going on there. So hopefully the, the, the future will hold more trade shows, more nice opportunities as, as cannabis opens up in Europe. And um, hopefully more expansion with cookies as well. I can only see that um, brand doing more things in Europe as, as legalization continues. And um, they opened another store in Austria recently in Vienna. Um, so yeah, let, let, let's hope that the, the future is bright and the right brands. We're doing the right things with the right people. And just continuing to work. Sorry, I had something right. back by some guy on a really loud motorbike. <laughs> um, yeah, bro. Let's just hope it. Uh, let's just hope I'm working with the right people. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not in this to make become a millionaire. I'm in this just to to do. I mean, people always say like if you if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Mm-hmm. I've been in that position for a few years now, and I'm really really grateful for it. So I'm just wanting to continue to do exactly that. Okay. Less stress, more success, and working with the right people. Yeah, man. Well, uh, all power to you, and I do sincerely hope that that that's where you get. And yeah, well. Uh... We'll catch you in a few weeks in Product Earth. Um, yeah. Let's yeah. make that T-shirt for Product Earth, yeah? <laughs> we wear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's my pen? Where's my pen? Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. I would love to do it. I think that would be hilarious. We had a great picture. No, I, I appreciate you having me on, man. Um, like, we've known each other for years. I, I've always been an admirer of what you do. And anything I can do to support you um, in the future, you know what I mean? Maybe we do some... some, some giveaways or something like that that can help your people get the product that they want that cannot afford and you know things like that that's the sort of marketing i'd like to start doing 
Yeah, man, I've got some uh, some interesting ideas to run by you because, uh, yeah, the UK, I think, is going to move probably faster than we're expecting, depending on which conservative we inherit. And if it goes the, <laughs> yeah. the least wrong way, I think is the better way yeah. of describing that, then, yeah, the UK is going to blow up and it's people like oh, yourself that I think need to, need to help bring the real together so that we don't just end up with a nation of whatever a British chat is. Yeah, we're going to find out exactly what that is sooner rather than later. And let's come back to that someday and uh, we'll find out exactly what a British chat is because uh, they are coming. Yeah. Um, but hopefully uh, there's more of us than them and we get the job done the way we need to get it done. Well, there you go, folks. That was Kieran O'Leary. Uh, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed that. Great to get some insight into the Dutch coffee shop culture and scene, uh, the cannabis social club scene in Spain. So the differences between these two things get some real insight into kind of the, the marketing and the, the business aspects of cannabis uh, in Europe, uh, especially around sort of marketing, I thought was was quite interesting. Um, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed that, learned a few different things that I didn't know. i um, going to deep dive into some subjects uh, potentially for future guests, so put a pin in that one for now. If you enjoyed this content, do uh, please like, share, subscribe on YouTube, check us out uh, on patreon.com forward slash Simple Life as well, where you can help keep uh, the lights on in this place for less than a cup of coffee a week and help me upgrade the equipment uh, as I'm starting to recognize that I need some, some egg crates and whatever else up in here to dim this kind of slight echo reflection that I'm having to edit out which luckily you fine folks don't hear, but it is a pain to edit. All right, uh, yeah, everywhere on social media, at Simple Life, like, share, follow, whatever you do on each individual platform. We'll see you next week with some guest, I don't know, peace and love.